good afternoon and welcome to another wonderful sunset safari all the way from Juma Private Game Reserve in the beautiful Sabi San. My name is Ali and on camera with me is Craig and I just need to focus here for two seconds because multitasking might not be the greatest thing if we want to keep Craig on the vehicle with us. Oh, so we don't really know what our plan for the afternoon is. There's actually a track that I want to go take a photo of that we saw this morning, the porcupine track, because it was a beautiful track and I don't know why I didn't take a photo of it. I just forgot. But I think we're headed that way and then potentially towards Buffalsuk Dam, see if maybe the dogs that we had this morning ran to Buffalsuk Dam for a drink. I mean, to be fair, they could have pretty much run every anywhere. Just as long as they didn't run towards Torchwood Dam, then I'll be happy because <laughs> we can't really go there. But other than that, today actually feels like a leopard on a tree kind of day or afternoon, I should say, because the morning did not feel like that. The morning was too cold and windy. But now all of a sudden the wind has picked up, which is ruining my plans of finding a leopard up a tree because they won't really be up a tree if the wind is blowing like this, maybe down in a drainage line. But that's basically our plan. So we're just looking for tracks, scanning all around us just to see if we find our desired spotted cats in a tree, which would be very nice. But remember, this is your safari. You're jumping on the bus with us. So if you've got any comments, any questions, any special requests or anything that you particularly want to see within the scope of possibility, of course, <laughs> please just feel free to reach out and let us know. We much prefer it when we can speak to everyone because then it makes the drives that much better and that much nicer. It's almost like having real guests, but you know, instead of that, we have like an imaginary, this is how I imagine it, like a huge sort of school bus, a bunch of people, invisible people at the back kind of thing. If I had to put the digital world into the back of a game viewer, that's, well, that's roughly how I imagine it. So many good trees for leopards around here. Like, so we're just heading towards Buffalo's Hook um, cut line. We're coming up Galago Shortcut and lots of big trees around here, lots of marulas, lots of big sort of Scotia trees. So all great trees for a leopard to be on top of. So I have seen Tavangumi sleeping and being very happy on top of a tree. I will settle for a termite mount, I'm not gonna lie. I would also like that. But let's see what the bush actually wants to show us today. Don't really have that much of a plan, but we'll figure it out as we go along. But for now, let's just have a look and see what the weather will be doing today. Good afternoon, everybody. What a hot afternoon we are due to have today. I can already feel the heat, but luckily I've started my afternoon with a little bit of shade hopping, as have these lovely waterbuck. We have got a whole herd spread out in front of Gauri Dam in the usual patch of shade that I normally park in on the road. But what a lovely start to an epic safari adventure. My name is Tess. I'm going to be your naturalist on safari here for the afternoon. Behind the camera today is Tulani. I love it. We are so excited and we're hoping we're going to find some amazing things. But this is a good start. It's so nice having a big herd of waterbuck that have become resident again. So for ages we didn't see waterbuck other than sometimes those two cows and occasionally two bulls. But they weren't really resident. They would kind of move. So to see so many big ones, and especially so many males together, you can't see all of them, but I can see four going from left to right. I can see one in the sun, and then further right I can see two lying very close together. There's the other one lying down. Those magnificent horns. And then even further right than that, there is another one. There you can see him lying with his nose on the floor. Now I think it is going to be a really fun afternoon. Despite the wind, the wind is going to give us a little bit of a challenge because the herbivores are a bit nervous. But despite that, 
I think it's going to be a really good afternoon. Laura Cam, happy Friday. I'm so excited. It is going to be, I think, an absolutely awesome afternoon. I actually didn't realize it was Friday until this morning sometime. <laughs> because we're out here every day. Um, sometimes we don't remember what day it is. <laughs> so today's Friday, tomorrow is hopefully going to be Cata Day. But what I'm really hoping for is that this afternoon can be the precursor for tomorrow and that we get some luck with some rosettes in particular. I feel like it's been a little bit too long since I last saw a leopard. Oof, I'm sure you can hear the wind picking up. And what we have done to combat this heat today, because look at that, there's not a cloud in the sky above Gauri Dam. But I'm sure you can see all the trees blowing. To combat the heat, we have discovered that if you wet a kikoi, put it in the freezer and bring it on dry, it is the perfect thing to keep your legs wet and cool. So that is what we have done. So we are ready, we are hoping for an action-packed afternoon. And I'm super excited that we started with some surprisingly relaxed waterbuck. Now, I really thought all the herbivores would be super nervous today, and in fact, as testament to that, we saw one Stienbach, just one, on the whole of quarantine. Not an Impala, not a Kudu, not a Nyala, not a Zebra. And that is fascinating because they were all there this morning. But with this wind, they're not feeling very safe, and it's extra windy up on quarantine. So we might have a little bit of a hard time with some of those herbivores. Luckily though, weather like this, it's still hot. We're still going to hopefully find elephants and things close to the dams. Maybe even giraffes and of course the hyenas and other predators might be out as well. But we're going to spend a bit more time at Gary Dam, try and get closer to the dam itself. And I'll send you over to Chris in Pridelands who's ready to say good afternoon. Hot afternoon, another absolute stinker here at Eco Training Pridelands. But when it's hot like that, elephants will go to water. So our plan was to head straight to Leopard Dam, and well, there's a young elephant bull. In fact, quite surprised an elephant bull of this age is not with his herd anymore, which is bizarre it's not unheard of anyway our plan this afternoon is to do exactly that water hole hopping we don't have many of those my name is Chris and Owen Dell still on camera operation today so check what the elephant is up to he's obviously eating some of those reeds as well there or reed grasses I actually don't even know what grass it is because I'm not very close to it and see how they've depleted it the only little bit of juicy green stuff that they have at the moment that's nutritious until the rains come. And you can see he's obviously sprayed himself with a bit of mud to help him cool down. I think that herd of buffalo might actually swing past this way a bit later. I don't think we'll sit here the whole afternoon. I'll just watch him eat his, his late lunch. And we have our grey heron, who's still standing like a statue. Dead still. Hi there, Sam wants to know how much milk does a baby elephant need when it's born? Sure. Goodness. You know, I have studied it. A long time ago, but I actually cannot remember, to be honest with you. I think it will be in the region of, I think I probably can probably consume, if I'm thinking and doing the mass, probably about 
about five, four or five liters, I think. Even if it's that much, but I don't think they'll have that in one go. Actually, something worthwhile to to research. And that's just in one go. I don't think it's that they drink in total. I, Brad wants to know if storks have a symbiotic relationship with other animals. Uh, Brad, not this species, uh, or not particularly. They, they just associate it with water and that's where they can, can find food. Coming back to the elephants, I think it's about four or five liters usually in a go, but that's not how much I drink in an entire day. I think it's somewhere in the region of about 15 liters in a day, about three gallons r roughly. That's an astonishing amount of milk. And they cycle for about two years. I think yeah, that sounds about right. Can work on about three gallons. It's a lot of milk. But then again it's a hundred kilogram calf when they're born, you know? It's not a small, it's not a small baby. And they grow quickly. So then they need more milk. From the first month onwards, they start eating solids. And often their first meal will be actually the feces of the mother. And that inoculates their gut with the necessary fungi, bacteria, and protozoa to digest their plant diet. Listen up, explorers. We have a brand new prize. This time you can recline riverside at the breathtaking Settlers Drift Lodge at Garicha Game Reserve. Take a breather from your busy life. Why not treat yourself at the spa or wander into nature on a guided bushwalk, twice daily safari drives or even a boat river cruise. Open to all levels of explorers. Sign up before the 28th of October and it could be you jetting off to this luxurious lodge.
Now I'm making my way down towards Twin Dams because I want to go and see if there might be some elephants that want to pop up in that direction. Maybe some leopards as well. That is the last known direction of Molawati last night. We didn't have any tracks around there this morning though, so I don't know where Molwati went. Maybe he crossed south into Little Gauri. I don't know. But we're gonna try. We need some rosettes. So we're also wanting to do some birding. We were just chatting about what we are wanting to see this afternoon. We've also got Panda Bear on the back. He's gonna be taking over a little bit later on. We were chatting and I was saying I want some elephants at the dam. I'd love to see a leopard and birds. I want to see birds. Tulani wants to find a leopard. I like it. Very dedicated. Very focused. He gave one answer. Leopard. Of course. Panda Bay also said elephants. No other preferences. So it sounds like we're all on a very similar wavelength moving forward. So we are going to try try and channel all of that energy into into finding elephants and leopards oh, I'm excited I can see quite a few zebra tracks I think these might be the zebras from quarantine the ones that we had there this morning because I did not see any zebras there ah oh. I believe the wind is quite excessive today. I do apologize. Being live in the bush, you know, we can't control these things. I know it's very windy outside. I shall try and keep myself talking so that you don't have to listen to the wind. I know that the wild dogs were around here with Ali this morning. They moved east from the Mulawati, so maybe they're going to pop up around Twin Dams as well. Wouldn't that be exciting? I did wear my lucky wild dog shirt this morning, so I'm happy that it works. It doesn't matter who it's lucky for, as long as somebody has luck, then I know my shirt works. twin dams and maybe some of those birds but it sounds like Chris has actually found an elephant unlikely oh little boy is still having a phenomenal lunch there you can just see how he's relishing it eating That lovely green reeds there. So far, the only real action other than the heron. But it's nice, the elephant. I love elephants, you know. It's my favorite animal of all. Oh, he's smelling that other green stuff. And he's walking. No. What is this? Can I eat this? Right, off to the next tuft of reeds. Martin. Martin wants to know, how does an elephant calf protect itself during an attack? All right, so Martin, a bit of background there. The only real threat to them is lions, mainly. And the calf itself, are unable to defend itself. If it gets separated from the herd or the mother, lions can take them and it has happened. I've seen several accounts of this, uh, not in person but on footage. It's not common. Protection is the onus of the mother and close relatives. And when the calves are especially very small at first couple of months, 
weeks to months. They guard them very, very closely. They're always almost underneath the mum's legs and in between. And they're often surrounded by bigger elephants who are very efficient at repelling lion attacks. So the protection can't protect itself, but the protection would be very much the duty of the mum as well as relatives around it. Remember, a whole herd of elephants is essentially a group of related females and their offspring that are not yet grown up. <laughs> They're trying to get up there. Put it in low range. There we go. <laughs> I think elephants are the ultimate 4x4. Four four, hey? They can just go about just about everywhere. Except like cliff faces. <laughs> what are you going to break now? There's so many other trees. Don't break those, man. That's our little knobthorn lane on the damn wall. Listen, no man, I'm just having a twig. Good day, Michael. Michael wants to know if it's rare to find an elephant without the rest of its herd. Michael, no, not at all in this case. This is a young bull. So. What I, what I just mentioned about uh, a group of elephants, mostly related females and their offspring. So the females stay with their natal herds, whereas the young males disperse once they go into their early teens, sometimes a little bit later. And they will then either become solitary or they'll join up with other small groups of males. So the males have no permanent association with the breeding herds, the actual herds. Some males form herds of their own when we've got that group of 16 here yeah? but it's not a permanent sort of arrangement like what you would have with the females so it's not unusual to find a young elephant bull by itself it's not 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 that i need to get my binoculars i think i might just have seen a bird that was very unusual i can't say what it is Is that a purple crested Turaco? I saw a darkish bird with red wings at very much Turaco like shape. There, you can hear it. It's in that Northorn to the right, the, the first one. And on the other side, yes. I heard it there now as well. Come on, you need to show your face. This is a very cool bird, people. I've not yet seen it, Pridelands. Now I can't see it. I'm just trying to get Odie to see if we can. Let's drive around, guys. This is something special. Let's drive around. I hope it doesn't fly off. But I'm convinced that this is a purple crested Turaco. It used to be called a purple crested Luri. So they are sort of like a glossy purple color. Beautiful red wings with this red, red, red sort of coloration in between sorry look at this it is a stunning bit and I heard it there I'm, I'm convinced it's that it's an unusual bird for this area because they prefer riverine areas so a place like Juma you might see them I can't think I've actually seen them but they like often sort of riverine forests so let's just go easy on this one and see if we can't see it oh there's a diker running as well i'm sure so i just saw that red under the wings it's a relative of the go away birds remember the go away birds used to be called luris as well now the luris are called Turacos. Yeah, that's a flip. And if it if it if it was a 
just check here a little bit. If it was a, a go-away bird, it would have sat on top. It won't go into the canopy. If I can get this bird, I'll be so happy. It would very likely go to one of those leaves with some foliage on it. Where are you? Go make some noise. Make some noise. You know, if this elephant have moved off, we can we can actually hop out on foot. And he is on the way eastwards. Maybe we'll be able to maneuver ourselves better. Go a bit forward. Might have flown off again. It's a possibility. Maybe in that burbin. Stay and wait, maybe it hops out somewhere.
Okay, so we've got a little bit of a different scene over here. Panda actually, with his excellent eyesight once again, has spotted something a little bit unusual. I don't know if you can see what it is. So here's my feather coming in. It is a baby bird. Unfortunately dead, which is why I'm touching it with the feather, just to show you what it is. I'm not going to be disturbing it though, because Panda actually spotted it because a southern yellow-billed hornbill was trying to eat it. How fascinating is that? Now it's not the most pleasant thing to see, so if you are a sensitive viewer, I do apologize. Maybe best to look away. But this is definitely something that is part of nature and it's a first for me. I've never seen a southern yellow-billed hornbill trying to eat a chick. I don't know what bird it is. I know that it's already started growing little primaries on the end of its wings. But I also know that it is very freshly dead. It's a fresh kill and I don't think the hornbill killed it. I think the hornbill found it. And I say that because of the intense winds. So Tulani, maybe you can show the blowing of the trees. If we have a look at the wind, I have a feeling that this baby bird was in a nest up in one of these trees and just so happened to get blown out. And I think the hornbill was being very opportunistic. We do have a vehicle wanting to pass through, so we are going to move on. But I did want to show you what the hornbill was eating because it's a first for me. It's a very sad, very sad part of life, unfortunately, but something that the hornbill absolutely needs to keep itself going. Thank you, Tilani. The vehicle is gone. A little bit of a strange situation, I know, and in fact, Unfortunately, we would have actually gotten the hornbill eating it, but the hornbill flew away. It was, you know, I think a bit nervous of the vehicle. And uh, we didn't actually know what it was eating. And then when we pulled up and we saw it, and I pulled out the binoculars, I noticed it was this little baby bird. And I thought, that's really, really odd. We watched it for a couple seconds and it flew off. But I think it'll probably come back, which is why I don't want to disturb that little baby bird. Because something will eat it, whether it's the hornbill or whether it's something else. That is food that goes straight back into nature, as unpleasant as it is. From the shape of the beak and the colors of the primaries, it almost looked like it might be some form of maybe a starling. Very pointed beak and very blue feathers on the primaries, dark navy blue. But I didn't want to play with it too much because we also don't want to interfere. I don't really want the smell of that bird on my hands. I don't really want the smell of my hands on that bird because animals are then going to be potentially put off by that and so we want to leave it and let nature take its course but it is dead I know that it is dead and it's it's a very sad situation but again part of nature something that we witness something a little different we want it different I don't think we were expecting that kind of different to be honest wow unusual so you actually also don't realize how big southern yellow-billed hornbills are until they're that close to the vehicle. And they have a whole baby bird in their mouth or in their beak. I think that southern yellow-billed hornbill's beak was about like that. You don't realize how long it is until it's there. Amy, it is sad to witness, but it is a fascinating process and I'd love to be able to go back and, and have a look a little bit later and see if anything's eating it or if it's gone. Um, I've made a mental note of where it is, um, but it's on, on Gauri Main, which means unfortunately it's a bit of a busy road and I was taking up the road, so oopsies. I had to leave. I do think it would be fascinating to have a look. I mean, with a chick of that that age, I mean, that, that's freshly hatched. Remember, birds are different to mammals. They are not born able to look after themselves. Most species of birds are born naked, blind, all of these things, and that's exactly what the chick was. So it is very, very freshly hatched. Its eyes weren't open yet. Just the tiniest little row of primaries right on the tip of the wing. So basically on the outside of the arm like that. But I would love to be able to actually go and, and show you all the different parts of the anatomy. But at the same time, the reason I don't want to is because I saw something feeding on it. 
I don't want to ruin that animal's chance just because I came along. That's not fair. What if the hornbill did work for it instead of finding it on the floor? I don't know. We didn't see that part of the process. So it wouldn't be very fair on the hornbill for me to go and steal that and start playing with it. Or showing you all the different parts because then the hornbill might not come back. It might have been a very hard earned meal. Oh, different, wow. Very, very different. I think I'll swing past there a little later and see what's happening. Maybe something will be there. But anyway, we are now here towards Treehouse Dam. We want to see if there's anything on the western side. So this morning I did a little bit more central. Today I'm going to do, this afternoon I'll do a bit more west. Purely because we didn't have any leopard tracks in the central parts or the eastern parts. The only tracks we had were crossing south over Shibamo Track, Gauri, Maine. Mulawati's coming east and then we think south and then possibly Shidulu going straight over. And uh, chances are, if they do come back, they'll probably come back towards Monkey Island that area. So that's the plan. Check Monkey Orange, check Zoe's. And then from there, we'll probably head all the way up to Sandy Patch and check maybe a little bit along Biffles of Katlan, see if we can find Tavangumi. Just on that far western side. We're not going to go towards the eastern side. I think we're going to cover that today. Maybe, hopefully, either some rosettes pop out or some dogs. Either way, I will be happy. Whether it's me or Ellie that gets them, as long as one of us finds them, I'll be happy. Bonus, bonus points. But this time of the year, I mean, it's something that I remember distinctly from growing up, going back to that baby bird. There are intense winds in Port Alfred. Every time we used to visit, because it used to be holiday and now it's home. Every time we used to visit, sorry Tulani, I'm actually going to go back down the dam wall because of the sun. Um, there were such intense winds and unfortunately baby birds get pushed out of the nest too often by wind. It just shakes the nest too much and they fall out. But anyway, I'm going to try and get this hippo for you and in the meanwhile, I will send you over to Ellie who's on a mission this afternoon. Well, we've got a puzzle, that's what we have. But I just wanna go check where these tracks go. Maybe just go a little bit. So we've got to, we're in sort of like uh, Buffalo Road, hippo pools, um, What's the name of this pan? Gwari pan. And we have leopard tracks pretty much going everywhere. They're not particularly fresh. We have a set of female tracks going from this road towards um, Chita Katlan and then they cross onto Torchwood and I would imagine Tlalamba has been out and about. Uh, but those ones seem to be the older set of tracks and I remember Cedric mentioning yesterday because we always do sort of like a lowdown who's been where and what's been happening. And he mentioned that they've had tracks for Tlalamba around this area, but then more fresh than that, and even maybe from last night or this morning. I mean, it's very, as I was saying, tracks tend to age quite a bit when the wind is around because they don't look as crisp. So um, they might be a bit older or they might be just actually from earlier today and we wouldn't know if the wind has been blowing a lot. They do have some grass and so on, but like I said, those are the tracks for a male leopard and they're heading towards Bovozog Dam, which is, it's been interesting because I haven't seen male tracks in this area in quite a while and it looks like for a big decent sized male, or at least, you know, not a, not a youngster. So I don't know who it could be, potentially Molowati I would imagine. I don't think Tavangumi hangs around this area. I think there was that other male called the Timbavati male and I know he used to hang around in Singa in that area so maybe the, this set of tracks belong to him. I haven't seen him and I actually don't think I've ever seen him. So but I just want to figure out where these tracks go before I start going in the wrong direction because I actually have a feeling they go down. So I just want to quickly check. I mean they might be old but who knows. They might lead us to something. Might as well try. Let me just have a look here. I don't like this vehicle tracking, it's not my best. But lots of tiny, tiny, tiny elephant tracks all around. But no leopard tracks. Mm, let's head towards Buffalo's Dam. And then if not, we'll just do a loop around there and come back around here because it was walking in a pretty steady direction. 
So I wonder if maybe you just didn't hear the elephants. Although actually I like, I'm making that up because the elephant tracks are far fresher than the leopard tracks. There are just tracks everywhere. Could be. Who knows? I have seen Shasha before at Buffalzook Dam, but I don't know when is the last time that he was seen. Also, like, I think he stopped hanging around in this general area and then he went back south and he had been hanging around somewhere there. So I think maybe let's stick to our plan for a change and uh, hope for the best. Because if it is Molowati, Molowati is a dominant male leopard around this area, if you're just tuning into the show or you don't know what I'm talking about. And he's not particularly relaxed around vehicles, which has been a real pity because watching a big male leopard it's actually very cool because they are massive. I don't think we give them enough credit for size. But unfortunately, he's not too fond of vehicles. Oh, there's more leopard tracks. So he doesn't allow us to see him for too long or to get too close to him. But I have seen on sort of social media that there have been more and more, at least brief sightings of him. So who knows, maybe there's hope. I know Tingana, when he first started being seen in this area, well, he got the name Tingana, the shy one because he wasn't also too fond on being seen by anyone, but I mean, nobody knows where Tingi actually came from. So if there was hope with Tingana and then he became such a chill leopard, he would just walk next to the car and not worry about anything. So, you know, I'm kind of holding out hope for Molwati. Maybe he'll change, <laughs> but let's see. Just wanna keep my eye out here. We're still looking for that mystery bird which we thought was a Turaka but I can't see it now. So now we're back on our model. Our grey heron just sitting on his log there. Just watching the water for some frogs and stuff. He's doing some funny stuff. You know, every now and then stands on one leg then he preens himself then he just checks the water again. So let's watch him. So for those who don't know, that's the grey heron. He's preening himself there, plucking some feathers. Nice little bit of wind coming up now as well. I kind of like, like the reflection of the water at this angle. It's bright, but it's, I don't know, it gives it yeah, sort of like, uh, it's like this feeling, I don't know. Brightens my eyes. Mm. Oh, here comes the wind, bringing much needed relief from the heat. So we have backed up a little bit away from Treehouse Dam at the moment, trying to find a nice view and hopefully some shade, but we didn't do very well on the shade part, we got some partial shade. And we've got a beautiful big hippo in the dam. I don't know which hippo this is, but it was here this morning, so nice little surprise to find overnight. And he looks as though he is just checking us out, making sure of what we're doing, that we're not kind of coming in to have a swim in the dam on such a hot day. And I think just enjoying a bit of the sun. 
But you won't believe what we drove past <laughs> on the way to the dam just now. Went up onto the dam wall, didn't notice, and then came back down. And then Panda and Tulani noticed, not even me. And Tima. <laughs> She's having a nap in the quarry shade. She was on her side and she's just kind of popped up onto her tummy and she is looking so relaxed. So I wouldn't be surprised if the other hyenas are somewhere in the drainage line water to have a mud bath and I think just enjoying this wind. Great advantage for the predators. It can also be a disadvantage but it's mostly going to make the herbivores uncomfortable. Is, this is probably a blessing you know they've got a pretty thick coat they're very active so when it is a nice windy day and they find a patch of shade it's the perfect chance to catch up on all the sleep you missed when you were out on your adventures during the night and a really from the heat if you're sitting in the sun even with this wind what? but look from a distance how good her camouflage is there in the shade it's no wonder we didn't see her So like that, you can see her hump of her shoulders, you can see some of the spots, the ears, the nose. But as you go out and look at a wider picture, I mean, she looks like part of the furniture. She looks like a termite mound underneath a quarry tree. Unreal, isn't it? Amazing. And Mr. Hippo is still kind of checking us out. He hasn't really moved. He's put his eyes under water briefly and is mostly just listening to what I'm saying about Ntima. I don't think he agrees or disagrees. I think he's fairly neutral on the point. He hasn't had a reaction. But it is nice to see him. Oh, he heard that. He looked up when I said he doesn't have a reaction. He's going, don't make assumptions, madam. But you can see how strong that wind is. Look how that water is parting around him. So many little waves on the water, some ripples. It is windy. Also part of the reason why we didn't stay on the dam wall. It is so windy up there that I think we'll lose half of half of ourselves and the equipment if we park up there for too long. <laughs> but I do want to have a look and see if the yellow-billed stork is there. I didn't see it as we glimpsed past on the dam wall earlier. And then we also want to check down into the drainage line to see if there are any hyenas there mud wallowing. And then from here we're going to be heading straight west towards Monkey Orange Road. Hello Sleepy and Tima. Tim, that is a really fascinating question. I don't know what kind of stomach issues a hippo would have. I mean, um, it, animals are always prone to having some form of either diarrhea or constipation or anything in between, I suppose. Just like us, everybody is human or animal. These things happen. Hippos literally only eat grass and occasionally you'll see them eating off of carrion. So if there's a dead carcass somewhere, well, dead implies carcass, carcass implies dead. I'm being very redundant, I'm so sorry. If there's a carcass, hippos have been known to taste them every now and then to kind of eat little bits and pieces, but I think that's more gathering information than actually eating for digestion. So hippos literally only eat grass, and I think if they had a bit of a bad stomach, they might change water holes because maybe it's bacteria building up in the water hole. But in general, hippos have much stronger immune systems than a lot of the other animals because they live in water and mostly in this area still bodies of water in dams not in flowing rivers so what that means is there's always going to be a buildup of bacteria and things like that because animals are swimming in there with open wounds they're defecating they're urinating sometimes even if you're a hyena you're vomiting you know wild dogs and things vomit as well so Unfortunately, there is always a buildup of bacteria in this water and hippos have a pretty strong immune system to cope with that because they live in amongst these bacteria. So I don't know how we would know if a hippo has a bad stomach. As is, they already fling their poo everywhere. They fling their dung with their tail. It's already fairly loose. You can easily see hippo dung on the road because it's so broken up and you can still see the grass fibers in it. But 
I don't know if we'd even know that a hippo has a bad stomach. <laughs> Maybe if we saw it flicking its tail constantly but nothing was coming out, we'd know it has a bit of an issue. A backup issue instead of a free flow issue. <laughs> but I would, see, I would assume they either just eat more or less grass, maybe different types of grass. I've never seen a hippo browsing. You know, something like an elephant would just eat more fiber if it needed to bulk up on fiber to get the stomach moving, for example. Hippos only eat grass, they're grazers. So I don't actually know what else they would do other than maybe changing the water source, changing the water hole to a cleaner one or a bigger one that's got less concentrated bacteria. Or I suppose they just wait it out. They're in the perfect place. It's not like they have to move to go to the bathroom if they do have a problem. They just flick their tail wherever they are. <laughs> but I'd never thought about that before today. Had you, Panda? Tulani, had you ever thought of that? <laughs> I'd never thought of that. Hippos with a bad stomach day. I mean, fascinating thought. I'd, yeah, wow. I'd never thought of that. Thank you. I will now never unthink that. I don't think. <laughs> now that it's there. One of those things when you see it, you can't unsee it. <laughs> so now that I've thought it, I will never unthink it. <laughs> All right, I'm going to get up onto the damn wall very briefly to see what else I can see. And I'm going to send you over to Sa Sally, to Ellie, to see what she has. <laughs> Well, at least I wasn't wrong when I said the, <laughs> the elephant tracks were much fresher than the leopard tracks. What's wrong? Don't be, a, don't be an ugly youngster. We were here before you. You actually crossed the road and we were already here. Seems like it's a, well, we've got a breeding herd. It's this one that you're looking at. It's a young male and he's just been a little bit unsettled. It's quite windy and we also had one of the females not too interested in us and the wind just annoys elephants. Just imagine those big ears and then having all that in you. It's not ideal. They're pretty alert. Most of them have stopped feeding. They're just kind of checking us out, not because they're aggressive towards us or anything, but it's just they're unhappy with the current environmental circumstances. So it seems like maybe two youngsters in this group. I think maybe this one has also calmed down a little bit. When I say youngsters, I'm talking about maybe like two, four years old, and then this seems to be one of the bigger adolescent ones. So it's not uncommon for elephants just to behave this way and then just to show that they're big and try to intimidate you, especially by opening their ears or just standing tall. But I'm not sure why it's acting this way. Because when we first arrived, we saw more elephants, another mom and a cub who is actually going to join the herd as we speak. And they were pretty chilled. So remember, it's a live and interactive show. So if you've got any questions or comments, please send them through. <laughs> If you want to tell us what you think is happening with the elephants, I'm going to put my wild guess on the wind, actually. I don't think they're too happy with it. It's windier than what I thought it would be, even when you're sitting still. Guys, don't give us attitude. Also, you've just arrived to the party, ma'am. Shame, you do look uncomfortable. And it's quite funny because they crossed the road and then in front of us and now they've just gone into this little thicket and it seems that maybe <laughs> I think they're going to try to go into the drainage line of Niala Road. But perhaps they haven't chosen the best spot to go down. Maybe they just want to come back onto the road to then go down. You see that head bobbing or that swing of the head when they walk. That's general, generally an elephant giving you a bit of attitude. Again, not to do anything but show off, as in like, you know, I'm big, I'm here, I'm cool, stay back. Henry, um, when an elephant is in must, the scent doesn't really deter predators. I actually don't know if there have been any studies shown that animals or potential predators for elephants can and I'm going to say the only potential predator of elephants in certain areas in the natural world might just be lions. Certain prides of lions have learned how to hunt elephants, but they generally go for younger bulls. Bulls that have separated from the main herd, bulls that are not in a group anymore because they're the easier target rather than going for big adults um, that are in must. 
So, I mean, maybe the extra testosterone would know, but to say that they know that an elephant is in must and might be a bit aggressive because of it, I don't think so. Uh, but elephants being a must does tell other elephants what's happening and that there's, it's, you know, an elephant to, to look out for because they've got that extra bit of attitude. And even for us, you can smell an elephant in must from miles away. It's a very, especially when they're in full must, very, very pungent smell. I don't know how to describe it. It's quite acidic almost in a way. But I think none of the elephants around here are in must. It's just a breeding herd and the youngsters and the males that are with the group are still way too young to start going into must. Generally only come into must, I would say maybe around their 20s, mid 20s or so, once they leave the, the main herd. Guys, I'm gonna move a little bit forward because I think the Ellies are trying to come into here and they're, they're not comfortable with the wind. So I'm gonna go forward, give them a bit more space and see if they'll be our friends. Because they're all walking quite tightly packed together. Okay. Uh, let me just reverse in here. Please no stumps here. There we go. I think maybe a little bit further back. Hey guys, did you decide that was not the way you were going? We actually thought that they had already been to the dam because they look quite dark like they've been in the water today but maybe they're still slowly making their way towards Buffalzook Dam. Still a while until they get there but maybe if we're patient enough with them and we're just going to keep an eye to see in which direction they go. If they go towards the drainage line then we know they're not going to the dam but maybe if they continue in this direction and go in front of us then there might be hope that they'll go to the dam.
reminiscing about finding these tracks this morning. Ooh. So this is where we had Molwati's tracks, one Shabama track. So many tracks in one sentence. And the tracks are heading south straight towards Gauri Main. So we quickly want to check the little pan systems here and then we're going to crow across to Monkey Orange. And we have a great plan to check all of these southernmost roads in the western part before we head up towards Sandy Patch for Tamagini. Purely because we have a Shadulu feeling today and I cannot ignore the Shadulu feeling. I can't. So hopefully we end up finding her somewhere in this western part. It's actually interesting, even though we saw these tracks this morning, seeing them again now, your heart kind of skips a beat and you go, ugh, flip track. Even though I know that I found tracks here this morning, it's the same tracks. <laughs> but you still get so excited. Oh, sorry everybody, this wind is unreal. Back to this so windy I could not hear what Sihle said in my in my ear there, lovely Sihle, but I know that I'm going to be sending over to Chris. So let's go to Chris. Right. Another leopard tortoise. And the second one in two days that I've seen. And I always say, I'm a firm believer that this is a sign that we are getting closer and closer to the actual start of the rains. There's a very big male. I can't actually show you now why it is a male from where he is. So I'll need to show you underneath. And I'm not going to pick him up now because... He might urinate as a defense mechanism and that can cause him to dehydrate. He's far from water. That's why we don't, I don't like to pick these guys up. Some people do, but I don't. I don't like it. Uh, but underneath the shell, that bottom shell, the plastron, it's got a bit of a, it's like a, got a little dent, like a concave dent in it. And that's to fit on top of the female's upper shell, the carapace. And you'll also see with the females, the rear part of the carapace there, you can touch them, that's fine. These things are, so the rear part of the carapace, with the females, it's a little bit gradual. The males got a very sharp sort of dip there. So the females are a bit more gradual, especially that area. There yeah, you <laughs> Trying to, to move. <laughs> anyway, so, and that's for the male to be able to fit on top there when they copulate. Often amazed how if on safari I get, especially kids, and not not picking them up but touching them is fine. You know, you can you can you can you can look at and, and feel these these scoots. You can even like kind of like count them, and it will give you an indication of how old they are. So let's go. It's about 20, 20 scoots on top of each other there. Could be about 18 to 20 years old. Could be. These guys are very long-lived animals. If not killed by something and conditions are well, they can get to 100 years. No problem. Out here, they probably don't live that long because of the fairly regular occurrence of bushfires, which is other than dehydration, hornbills, predation, as well as fire, they are main, their main, how can I put it, uh, limiting factors. It's also a protected animal in South Africa, you're not allowed to harvest it from the bush, whether it is for whatever reason. Very big males, I must say. The males are much smaller than the females, the females are usually much larger than the males. There's these little head peeking out there. <laughs> you know what? We sometimes need to entertain ourselves in the bush, you know? Sitting watching turtles and tortoises and terrapins and lions and things. 
We don't have turtles here. They're not where we are. We've got terrapins though. But this is a tortoise. Leopard or mountain tortoise. Well, that's our tortoise lesson for today. Let's head over to Amakala where Trish wants to say hello. Oh, we got such a shock when we heard that Chris had a leopard after those wild dogs. Was it yesterday or this morning? It was, I think it was this morning. Oh, that would have been quite exciting. Um, but here we are and we have leopards of our own, except they're giraffes. But they look leopardy, don't they, with their, with their pattern. And we're here in the uh, cheetah section of Amakala today. Hi everyone, me Trishala, got Vicky on camera. We're finally off the road after a flat tyre. Another flat tire. Um, so we're very excited to be on the side of the reserve. Obviously, uh, no cheetah has been found just yet. So I kind of like that. It means that we can we can go looking. Of course, tracking is going to be a little bit difficult, but it's nice and open. So it means that we can look out for the other signs. Maybe uh, some alarming. Maybe some antelope that are gathering together in the open area. Maybe looking a little bit skittish. Things like that. We can put those those bits of behavioral learning that we've gotten over the years to good use. So I'm quite excited to go looking for a cheetah. But I'm also very excited that we have these giraffe. There's about five of them. So, so relaxed, feeding on the sweet thorn quite close to us. The ossicones of these male giraffes, the ossicones that I've seen here, really, really thick, really healthy looking giraffes here. Not that the ones I've seen elsewhere are particularly unhealthy. It's just that these ones look particularly healthy. I love watching them eat because you can really see the way in which they manipulate the, the leaves with their lips and their tongues. and give the nostril a nice clean at the same time. Hi Mary, you'd like to know, that's actually an excellent question, you'd like to know if male giraffes grow, grow larger ossicones. They do have bigger ossicones than a female. So for example, the one we're looking at right now that's feeding on that sweet thorn quite intensely is a male and you can see that his ossicones are quite thick but you can also see that they're bald on top but if we go over to this younger one that's just leaning down to eat there that's a female and then when she lifts her head up you'll be able to see that her ossicones are a little bit skinnier and they're there's a tuft of hair at the, at the top. Now this male would have had a tough a tuft of hair at one point too but because of him using his ossicones to fight with other males they have bolded oh did you see that oh, I have to go there oh <laughs> let's go let's have a look at the female so there she's showing us her ossicones quite skinny and you can see very obvious tufts of hair at the top of hers but i said it's a really interesting question because i was thinking so we know that males have larger ossicones and they're bald at the top. But I was thinking about whether they grow thicker as they grow older or whether they kind of stay, they kind of reach the critical mass kind of thing. I would say that they would grow in proportion to the male because all an ossicone is is ossified bone. It's, uh, or it's kind of caked on top of each other until this ossicone is formed. And as the animal grows and its bones grow, I'm going to make a safe assumption that there's additional bone that's put onto the ossicone or grown onto the ossicone as well. That is an excellent question. Look at his cheeks. His cheeks are full. <laughs> 
look how carefully he eats around the thorns and he'll be very, very careful to make sure that he doesn't eat any of those thorns especially because they're really really large really long and quite thick but if he does take some of the younger ones it'll be okay Skull. Ah. Hi, Fred. You'd like to know if giraffes have a very strong skull. They certainly would have a strong skull, but it's not as if it's particularly heavy or anything like that. But they do have a very strong, strong skull. Um, like any animal, really. Particularly any big mammal. It's important to have strong a strong skull and the growth of bone is, you know, real relative to the or the growth of bone in the skull is relative to the growth of bone anywhere else in the body so if you're a big animal that has big bones already your skull is going to be large and heavy but the thing with the so i understand where you're asking this from fred and that because they constantly or rather when they're fighting amongst themselves the males will will do what's called necking and they'll swing their necks from side to side and hit their heads into the neck of their opponent. And you would think that maybe they have really, really strong skulls for that. But the force of that, the force of that swinging is actually generated by the fact that the neck is so long. So it ends up being, if you can imagine, a string with a ball at the end. So they can really swing the weight of their skull, even though it's not significant, like not not a, a hugely dense skull, because they've also got to be able to lift the skull up off the ground, which takes a lot of effort. But the fact that they have this long neck allows them to swing and and create or generate acceleration as they move their head from side to side. So it's that force that really causes the damage. And of course, those ossicones, they land perfectly on a neck. That can be very, very painful. They look so careful when they eat. Out comes that tongue. So I said to you that if it'll really avoid the larger thorns, but if it takes in some of the smaller ones, it's not a big problem. They have really thick saliva that allow them to uh, orientate the thorns in the right way for it to go down their their throats with minimal damage. How's it going, Wild Earth? My name is Igor. I'm a camera operator for Penguin Beach. I've been a camera operator for almost 10 years now. What I love the most about working at Wild Earth is the amount of time that I get to spend in nature and observing animals in their natural environments. Not only that, but actually being able to see animals as they grow up. But when I'm not working on Wild Earth, what I love the most is to spend time in nature. I jump in the sea as often as I can. I take hikes. So I love being in the sea, I love being in the mountains, I love being in the desert. So I try and do that as much as I possibly can. The thing I love most about these African penguins is actually their character. If you look at the attitude that they actually have while going about their business, it is just the best thing. The questions I love getting the most from viewers are very thoughtful questions. Questions born out of genuine curiosity and a love and a passion for coastal wildlife. Well, we did eventually find our leopard tracks again, heading towards Bufuzuk Dam, but then nothing much around there. So we've come around hippo pools, and there's a track that goes just behind the dam wall, or so, not behind the dam wall, but in front of the dam wall, I mean, on the other side. So from Bufuzuk Katlaiden down. So I just want to quickly check there, you know, we might get lucky, although if this is Molowat, your chances of success are fairly limited. But you know, it could be that this is a day where he decides to show himself. Maybe because the wind is swirling, he won't hear us coming. A gal, you know, can only hope. And I think, where is this road? Is it this one? No. It's quite overgrown now. I hope I'm not gonna miss it. It's 
funny after you know even just a couple of months when you don't drive in a place there are certain roads and things where you look and you're like oh was it here was it a little bit further up the road I don't quite remember <laughs> oh but we found a bunch of animals here there's a zebra stallion some impala and two warthog and a wildebeest okay let me just up here just a little bit forward where we can see them all hopefully well, maybe not the warthogs Guys, you all need to stop running. We just want to make you guys famous and let you know that there's a potential leopard coming your way. I'm actually doing all of you future moms to be a favor. So we've got two piggies that seem they went onto Bovosuk Dam. We've got the impala. There's one lonely wildebeest as usual and one zebra stallion. Maybe the impala and maybe, well, I'm pretty sure they're all keeping each other company. Hello, piggy. You're also looking pregnant. That is a big belly. I wonder, we were discussing earlier today when the impalas are going to drop. I suspect it's going to be before November. So my money is at the end of October for some of them because they are looking, some of them are looking very big. Some not quite there yet. But between the impala and the woodland kingfisher is, you know, it's a race now. It's not too long until we start seeing them because I mean most of the cuckoos, well I'm not going to say most of the cuckoos, but I have heard different species of cuckoo calling already quite early. Kites are obviously back, Wahlbergs have been back for a while. Everything just seems to be happening a tad earlier this year. Now it's not uncommon for so many different species to hang out together. This is almost like a safe spot and they all feed at different levels. They're not technically competing for all the food that is around and the good thing is that there are many more eyes just looking out for danger. So if any of them were to make a, uh, an alarm call, the zebra, the wildebeest, the warthogs or the impala, then the rest of them would be alarmed. I think Tessa is looking at the same thing as us, so let's head over to her. I don't know if that's true. All right, everybody. So we have got some very nervous impalas. I know it's not a great view, but we literally can't move because if we move, they're going to move away further. This wind is absolutely messing them around. They are so nervous, they literally don't know which way to go right now. And that's why they're trying to find every little bit of cover, but with a little bit of opening that they can. Also, just to let you know, Panda and Tulani have now swapped. So it is now Panda behind the camera. There's his thumb, yay. <laughs> and we're just being patient to see if these impalas are gonna come out because they've been in the open but they just they're not comfortable and it looks like every now and then one or two of them are moving and then the herd will try and follow but this is a prime example of why windy days are predator advantages advantageous for predators it's a predator advantage and I just want to see they look like they're fairly settled where they are no they're coming back never mind see this is why <laughs> It's difficult to reposition because they keep moving everywhere we reposition they reposition and that's literally just how nervous they are so it's a pretty perfect example but imagine we we're chatting about it now imagine being an impala where you are a size that almost any predator can take down it's incredibly windy conditions on top of that you know that last night was a perfect night for predators to be out so the chances of having decent sleep are probably fairly limited and it's getting to that time of the day where it's starting to cool down so it's the time when predators are starting to move these impalas must be so nervous they don't feel it the same way that we do I don't think they've got the natural instinct they've got you know they're aware but they don't have the same way that the emotional center functions in their brain as what we do so it's not like they they could have something like an anxiety attack for example but you can see look at that the natural instinct is taking over because it's just so potentially dangerous today any movement that is too sudden any noise that they're not expecting 
is honestly just too much for them at this point and they're kind of scattering and then coming together again. I can see an ox pick on that one on the right back. It almost looks... Oh no, it's, it is a red build, I think. It almost looked yellow build in the light. Oh, shame now, so nervous moving again. Yes, both red builds, all three red build, okay. But they are just so nervous and this is really what I wanted to share with you because on windy days, you know, um, I know you can hear the wind and you can see the bush blowing, but to actually put it into a picture, to put that into words adequately is really hard sometimes. And this kind of sums it up. These impalas, I mean, you've seen impalas how many times? They're not acting like normal relaxed impalas. Look at them. They're moving and they're moving at speed. They're not sticking around anywhere. They're just not comfortable. Now, I don't think our presence will necessarily be helping this situation because they're probably going to be waiting for a noise or things like that. So we're not going to stick around too long. Bob, <laughs> I'm sure it's possible for animals to have heart attacks if they get a big fright, like, you know, there are some goats that apparently get very big frights and have heart attacks. There's also those goats that go really stiff and fall over. I don't know what that, <laughs> what that's, I don't think that's a heart attack, but, but it is quite cute to watch. Shame, the poor goats. I personally have not heard of an impala having a heart attack from a fright, but I have heard of impalas collapsing due to exhaustion. This would happen with any animal if it's pushed to its limits. So if these impalas are being chased and chased and chased by wild dogs and they run to exhaustion, they would potentially die from that. These poor impalas have no idea where to go. Okay, I'm gonna try and move back a bit, Panda. Just because now they seem like they are moving more towards this clearing in front of us. They seem to have made a little bit more of a solid decision. Don't know how long it will last, but they've made some form of solid-ish decision. I mean, look at that. They are standing facing every direction. They are moving, heads up, taking turns to feed. I wonder. I think I'm going to look a little bit more into that as well, though, Bob, to see if there have been recorded cases of animals having heart attacks, things like impalas having heart attacks from frights kind of reminds me of that that sighting with Taylor where the dwarf mongooses were playing dead with the southern yellow billed hornbills. <laughs> but that was just playing dead. That's just a, a technique. <laughs> so I must give a little bit of a shout out over here while I'm at it. <clears throat> I did actually receive some uh, feedback. Kimberly Lopez, thank you so much for the feedback. You sent me some feedback on Molwati and Tavangumi together since I was asking about that this morning and last night so I must thank you immensely for sending me a clip on that. I'm going to be watching it a little bit later when we are finished with the sunset safari but if anybody else has any questions, anything you'd like me to discuss, anything you want me to look for, we are live, we are interactive, please 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 do send those in. I would love to hear from you, it's amazing having you on the back with me so it would be wonderful to to have that extra bit of interaction with you as well. But thank you so much, Kimberly, for sending me some information. I look forward to going through that a bit later. All right, they look like they've kind of relaxed a little bit now, this half. But contrast, the other half <laughs> seems to be half panicking, half feeding. This is a very odd situation for these impalas. They're very much feeling uncomfortable. Shame. All right, I think what we are gonna do though, we are going to leave them to it, purely because I'm sure they are already nervous enough without the constant presence of us and the vehicle and the talking. So as much as they are beautiful and I want to watch them for ages, I don't want to make them unnecessarily nervous either. Not for extended period of time. Thanks ladies, and one gent. Stay safe. Okay, we shall move on to our leopard searching mission. Hopefully, fingers crossed, it goes well. So no luck 
unfortunately, well, I mean, we did come across the trucks and as we suspected, this leopard had gone to Bovozog Dam and had a drink there. But then on that two truck that we went to check, then we had the tracks coming out and then coming onto Bovozog cut line, going onto Bovozog. So I suspect good old invisible friend Molowati was the culprit of this because they look like quite sizable leopard tracks. So I think we're done with this area. We're going to potentially go all the way down. Maybe see if the road takes us to maybe Chitwa. That would be nice. Just to see how much water there still is, if all the Jakanas are still inhabiting <laughs> that big dam. And I don't know, I'm just... Although not too many things should be down there in this wind, but who knows, maybe because it's a little bit on a depression, maybe it won't be as windy. And there's a big dam wall. Anyway, it's a good, as good as plan as any. Maybe take a detour. Oh, now I want to go everywhere. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean to narrate all the thoughts that were going through my brain. Just trying to make a plan as to where we're gonna go from here. But I think maybe... I think actually we should do what we did in the morning. And then go onto thicker areas. Areas where are a little bit more densely vegetated because there's a better chance of actually finding things there. Because everybody's a, a tad cold. This wind has been strange and it's not a hot wind just yet because sometimes in the summertime you even feel this hot wind that just burns your eyeballs even. But this one has still a bit of a bite to it, so we're not in full-on summer yet, despite <laughs> despite our, our feelings. Because I think this is going to be one of those summers where we're going to get burned. Hmm. Hey babblers, have you seen a leopard? This is actually great weather for leopards to be out and about hunting. The wind makes a lot of noise. Potential prey species will likely not hear them. The wind starts blowing and if they choose their direction right, there's no chance that they'll smell them. a little bit sad that you missed a bit of an interaction that was on the game drive radio <laughs> just too late I love how much joy the Juma clan brings in the northern Sabi sand nature reserve honestly it is wonderful to hear the excitement from the guides on the radio about the Juma clan it I don't think all the time we realize how special and how lucky it is that we get to spend so much time with spotted hyenas that do not care whether we are there or not. That is very rare. I mean, yes, the cubs are interested in us so they know we're there and they probably like the fact that we're there because it's a new stimulus for them. But for the most part, they are very, very relaxed with us and almost pay us no attention and that is exactly what you want in the bush you want something untouched but at the same time as though we're not there wild but habituated but as though we're not there it is just so special and particularly with something like hyenas incredibly intelligent predators with these massive personalities and here we are and we get to witness these cubs growing up we get to witness the hierarchy of the clan we get to you know we get to know every single member I don't know where else in the world we can do that I really don't not that we can Wow hyena mom that's a really cool name so when the hyenas are they actually normally go to an old den that's what they normally do. So they will go to any of the previous dens that have been used by the clan. And if they decide to get an entirely new one going, then they will look for any termite mound that has been burrowed out. This is probably the most important thing. Burrowed out already by an aardvark. Because the adult hyenas don't dig. Ah. 
So essentially they need a termite mound that's already got a hole because the adults don't dig. They need something out that they can then just extend and the cubs can extend when they are born. And they need somewhere that's big enough to provide space with a small enough entrance that other animals can't get in. So things like lions and leopards be able to the entrance. This is vital. While dogs might be able to, but they might choose not to because the hyenas are stronger one on one. So those are probably the most important things, close to food, close to water, whatever you can find really. Very Well, it seems like it's an elephant day after all. Haha. -ha. No guys, don't go. I don't think this is the same herd that we saw earlier. There are a few of them missing, but they're also quite nervous with the wind. As soon as they heard us or could hear us coming, then they retreated back onto the bush on the right hand side. So I'm gonna stand over here because it seemed like they wanted to cross into Torchwood. And as much as I would love for them to stay on our side, I also don't want to be in their way if they've got better places to go. Maybe these guys have already had a drink at Bubbles and Dam. Guys, you can't make me stop here and not see you, but then you continue eating somewhere else. Naughty elephants. One, two, maybe five elephants. Small herd. I don't know if maybe there are a few more just hiding in the bushes somewhere. Could be. Can't see them from here. Malcolm, so a breeding herd is generally a herd and it applies to different species of animals, not only elephants, for example, impala or nyala, antelope species, and you identify them as generally the easiest ways to see if they are little youngsters like this one over here. So breeding herds are normally the females of all ages and imma in immature, as in like not fully independent elephants. For the vast majority of species, the females tend to stay in the breeding herd where they were born or in the if they are not territorial animals in the case of the elephants in the case of elephants is this way, so the females will stay with the herd and then the males will eventually spread their wings and then start looking for <laughs> for other companions and start lagging behind the herd and will start doing their own thing. So if you see an elephant on their on its own and there are no other elephants around and sometimes you if, especially if it's around a thicket you have to look properly because there might be more and you don't know. But if you see one or two roughly all of them the same size big elephants you can say that it's a bachelor herd so just all the boys and in this case it seems like it's two females and three youngsters potentially all of them related so the mother the oldest daughter her offspring and then the youngsters of the mother or the new siblings but it does seem maybe they're going towards torchwood dam just in that general direction going from one water hole to the next it seems like the younger female is actually quite heavily pregnant. I can see her now properly in, on the side and she's quite bulgy. So now that the rainy season is coming, there's the peak um, calving season for a lot of creatures. And it's much easier to find much more food and rear youngsters when you can find a lot of food to sustain yourself. Bye little Ellie's. The typical Africa shot, the animals walking away from you and then just swinging their tail in your face. <laughs> oh, elephants. At least you guys are nice. Just doing your own thing. I don't think um, if we go forward we'll be able to get a better view of her. There are some trees in the way. Are you guys going to stay there? Nope, okay. I mean, if you see her walking now, you see just how she's protruding on both sides. It almost seems like she's got like something pushing, like or you know, with elbows pushing to the outside. Then she's heavily pregnant. Elephants tend to be pregnant for <laughs> about 22 months, which is a long time. And then when the baby is born, in only a couple of hours, it's just able to stand up and then move. It's quite impressive, isn't it? Well. I think we're gonna continue, but in the meantime, we'll send you guys over to Trisha Domakala.
we are doing one of those things that are just wonderful to do. We're sitting and listening and watching. That's the best way, I think, to find a predator, especially if you have nothing to go on at first. So we're looking at the moon, or rather you're looking at the moon. Well, I have my binos out and I'm just looking over that landscape. You can probably hear that the wind has picked up quite a bit. Now, I am not sure. Ooh. Thought I had an amethyst sunbird for a second. Sorry for shaking the car, that was my frustration. It was an amethyst sunbird, at least it looked like one. Um, maybe I'll be able to get it back. Vigay, just keep an eye, it was on this, see these two bushes here? Mm -hmm. It was sitting, sitting on there, I'll, if it's just so you know. Hi, Jill. Sorry about the wind, guys. You'd like to know if it's common to find the moon during the day in South Africa? Um, yes, it's common to find the moon, moon during the day, I would assume, anywhere um, in the world, especially in areas where uh, the air is clean and it's, and it's not always overcast. Uh, so on a clear day, you should be able to see the moon, no problem. And also, if you've got a good pair of binoculars, You can have a really, really nice view. This good pair of binoculars is Byron's binoculars. I'm waiting on mine to arrive, but you can have a really, really good look. Um, but it is, it's fairly common to see the moon. I've seen, I see the moon all the time during the day. Um, and it doesn't only have to be in this phase. So at the moment it's in waxing gibbous. Waxing gibbous, so full moon should be in about two days or, some, or so. So obviously it's a little bit more, um, obvious and large at the moment. And it is stunning. I just had a look through my binos as well. Now this sunbird. <clears throat> I'm going to keep looking in this direction because it was beautiful. Pretty sure it was Amethyst sunbird. It was dark all over except for the front where there was a patch of green on the head. That's kind of all I saw. Uh, I wonder if I could just quickly move us. I'm just going to move back and get us another angle of this bush to see if I can, um, if I can get it. Because that would be another for my ghost bird list. I don't keep a bird list. Uh, I think, guess I kind of remember the birds that I that I've seen. This is the bush. So it was in those two bushes there. Uh, so I kind of remember the birds that I see and I don't, um, I don't know, I've never, I've never really kept a bird list. But I obviously know when it's a first for me and this would be a first, well it was a first for me but it would have been nice if I could have gotten a positive ID and most of all shown it to all of you and shared in the excitement. I were a sunbird, where would I be? Probably not around these sweet thorns. I'd be looking for... Whew. Did you guys hear that? That was the sound of a baboon alarm calling in the direction that we are hoping to find a cheetah. I think we need to make a move. A baboon alarm calling sounds like me once upon a time. I hope I'll be able to move and not shake you too much. Me once upon a time when 
can't remember what we needed to do, but we needed to fix something or the other, some tech up in Biffles Hook. And I went along with Alex and then nobody was there to open the gate and I saw that the electric fence was undone. So I thought, oh, maybe I'll just try and jump over and then put it into manual and let the others in. So I stepped on one of the bar, uh, one of the, the clips that hold the wire and it was fine. I tested it, it was fine. And then I touched the gate and then I, like a baboon, went, oh, and didn't remember much else and just kind of keeled backwards. Luckily I was caught. Anyway, let's go look for this baboon. African Penguin Awareness Day is on the way and while you could go and rent a tux to match our best dressed little beach roamers, here at Wild Earth we want to help make it a little simpler to celebrate them in style. Browse our online shops to find t-shirts, hoodies, tote bags and more, all with this adorable penguin beach design. Show these little guys some love and get your penguin beach merch today. I've decided it might be a good idea to show you the moon just now. It sounds a bit odd during the day, but we are almost, almost at full moon. Almost. So close. So this is going to affect animal movements quite greatly. But I want to find a clearing, so this clearing up ahead is going to be quite good, and then there won't be any, there won't be any trees in the way. How's that, panda? Is that okay? Perfect. Thank you. So we are almost at the full moon. It is looking magnificent. It's just that bottom little wedge, the bottom little semicircle that is missing. And this moon is contributing to things like the wind. It's also contributing to things like predator movements, especially things like wild dogs, which could be why we've been seeing them a bit more recently, because they can move a bit more during the night and hunt. But this is probably quite a relief for things like those impalas we saw earlier that were feeling a little bit nervous, because in the full moon, they've got a better chance of spotting the leopards and the lions. 
Now the only thing with this is if the wind continues, they will have a disadvantage still, unfortunately, because the wind will still cover things. It'll still cover sounds, smells, sight. And as much as it'll be lighter during the night because the moon is creating, well not creating, it's reflecting so much light, the moon does not create light, it reflects light. Because it will be reflecting so much light, we'll actually be able to see without spotlights, we'll be able to see with a naked eye, which means the animals can too. And that's normally an advantage in the herbivore, the prey species. It's normally an advantage for them because then they can see things approaching from a distance. But with this wind, if that continues, that is still gonna be stronger than the effect of the light that is reflected by the moon. Now, I would say that that is at about, oh, probably 96%, somewhere there. Probably sounds a bit strange, but basically what that means is in the next day, if it's not tomorrow, it'll probably be the next day, we'll have a full, full, full moon. Gary, yes, the birds can use the moon. It just depends on the birds. So if it's something like owls, then they can use that for hunting at night, but it can also be a slight disadvantage for them. I wouldn't say that birds use the moon for migratory purposes necessarily, but they certainly can because it does help with the general sense of direction. But you probably find they use something like magnetic field and actually memorizing pathways instinctually from other generations and following an instinct that we don't actually quite understand when they are migrating. But for birds that want to hunt during the night, absolutely, they can use the moon to pick up movement a little bit more easily. I think that would probably be the main advantage. And then it can be used for navigation. It just looks so pretty. It does feel strange today, even though we're through all of the clearings we've hardly seen any any herbivores at all it's just too nerve-wracking there's too much wind everything's moving away but I'm so happy to hear that everybody is absolutely loving Panda's work isn't that amazing hey Panda Bear <laughs> absolutely amazing he's whispering to me <laughs> It's very cool when we do actually get to look at the moon like this. And I also love it when we get to see the shape of the sun in sunrises and sunsets. But I think even better than this, by the time we get to tonight, Panda, maybe we can do a comparison and tonight we'll show the moon in the dark and see what it looks like then because it'll look even better than it does now, if that's possible. <laughs> Thank you, Panda Bear. Okay, as much as I love the moon, I do want to try and find some animals that are not all impalas. I'm still hoping for birds. I've seen a lilac breasted roller. No birds of prey yet this afternoon. That is weird. There's normally African harrier hawks, battaliers, Wahlberg's eagles in this area, brown snake eagle. We're on impala road. There's normally a brown snake eagle around here, close to power lines. And yet we haven't found any of those birds yet. So even they are being affected by this wind. I'm seeing the flash of breasted roller. Is it gonna land? No. <laughs> Shame the poor thing. <laughs> Did you see how fast it was being blown by the wind thunder? I think it probably wanted to stop and, and literally couldn't. I think it literally couldn't stop. And there are some impalas. This wind is Probably on the ground it feels quite heavy, but up there it must be almost gale force. Can you imagine? Oh, shame, these impalas are even looking so nervous. It's a beautiful young male, a yearling. About one year old, not yet ready. Oh, two. Fantastic. Okay, let me try to see if I bring through the storm. And found something small. Have you 
Oh, <laughs> I'm sorry. Craig and I just had a very sorry. I'm just moving things in the car. We had this amazing sighting of what we thought was a bushville gerbil. I was ready to jump out of the car. It's just like, oh my, it's the first one I've ever seen. And then it wasn't running away, which we were very happy about. And then all of a sudden, we could see it, and it's actually a squirrel <laughs> with a half burnt body and a burnt tail. That and it looks like a rat. Look at that. It's definitely a squirrel, but I don't know where it's been, but it seems like it was not in the best conditions or in the best spot. Oh, right, I don't know. Let me just try to go forward, see if maybe it doesn't run away. Oh, stay there. Look at that. So shame. It seems like maybe it was caught in a fire at some stage. Or maybe it's got mange even. I can't tell from here. I mean, there is some hair there. If it's mange, it would be a first for me as well. I've never seen a squirrel with mange before. Um, I don't know where it is, so I'm just gonna go forward. Come, Rusty. That is actually quite fascinating. I mean, really bad for the squirrel if it's burnt or if it's got mange. Can you see it? Forward, okay. okay. No, come back. So must I go back? Is it on the tree? On the back of the tree. Okay, maybe let's just be a little bit patient and then we'll be able to determine what it is that is or that's happened to the squirrel. I'm not sure where it is. I think I did manage to snap a photo because that's how we realized actually that it wasn't a gerbil because oh there it is definitely a squirrel shame what happened to you little squirrel do you want to tell us your story but it doesn't seem to be in the best condition does it if you just look at the sort of like at the base of its tail it almost seems like it had a callous um skin part there so maybe it has actually been burned come back squirrel please reveal yourself Hopefully it'll eventually. I think we might as well just sit down here and wait for a little bit. Just to see what's actually happening. Um, feel free to send us your comments on your questions if you manage to have a good screenshot or <laughs> if you have a guess as to what might be happening or what might have happened to the squirrel. I think it's like uh, we're playing the guessing game right now. It could have been many things. But, oh, Craig and I nearly jumped out of the car in excitement. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, some, when, you know, when we finally zoomed in and took the binoculars out, something just did not add to the thing. So another thing what binos are incredibly handy for, just to look for any potential small creatures that might not be who you think they are. Cannot stress the importance of having a good pair of binoculars if you come to the bush a lot. And I was very sad because on my last stint here, I actually, or somehow my binos were broken. I didn't break them myself, but they just appeared broken. Still, you know, the jury's out on that one. But um, thankfully then the company that I bought them with replaced them with a newer model. So I'm very excited about it. Because I got better eyes now. No, come squirrel. Don't be difficult. It could be that there's a hole on the other side of this jackalberry tree. Maybe that's why it's just gone in there and then won't come out. It's quite sad though. Let's just give it like another minute or so. Another young elephant bull is not the same one we had. And what strikes me about this elephant is that it's it's still a young male, uh, very likely still in his, I would probably say his late teens. But he's extremely tall for his age. And I think, 
actually suspect that he's got the potential to become a tusker. Judging the shape and the length of his tusks already. I like that shape. And if he's young, I would say region of about 17 years old. So he's essentially a teen. Remember that, especially during the first year, you can all to our sort of growth rate. Similar. And if you look at that tusk, that's, that's quite long. But still very thin, which is typical of the young bulls. I reckon this has got the potential to really become, you know, an elephant, the likes of Ezelwini and so forth. And for all we know, he might even be related to Ezelwini, maybe one of his offspring. I mean, I can't say that. Right, let's go over to Ali and see what she's up to. I'm not going to make too much of a noise because I don't want to scare it off, but we've got a wonderful view of the squirrel now, so you can just see sort of the top of its back and the tail, completely hairless. Completely hairless. I mean, it could be a case of mange. It does seem like it's got it's got dots all over, but uh, very strange. Shame, poor little squirrel. I mean, it seems to be doing fine. Just, it, it, I mean, it actually even looks a tad fat, to be honest, or maybe it's just the position, so it doesn't seem like it's been struggling for food. But I don't know if the hair is starting to regrow. I can't decide. <laughs> I'm leaning towards burnt. If it were, because it seems like it's obviously got some bare patches where it doesn't have any hair, but it seems like there's hairs growing in other places and now it's back on the ground just to pretend to be a gerbil I don't know, maybe because Halloween is coming up soon <laughs> it's also wearing a costume <gasps> the undecipherable squirrel for the year guys I think it's gone, it's won the best award but it's quite interesting I mean generally animals that have got mange they won't have any hair so this one still seem it had some hair growing just even still on the tail and on the back so I I'm not leaning towards mange. Mange would look more hairless. I actually don't even know if squirrels are very badly affected by mange. I've never seen something like this before, which is quite interesting. All right, little squirrel, you seem to be doing just fine overall, all things considered. But we're going to leave you behind now and then just continue moving down. That was so interesting. That was incredibly fascinating. <laughs> so... I think maybe I've got a I've got some friends and an uncle who's a vet. So I'm just gonna ask him what he thinks about it a little bit later after drive and then maybe we can just figure it out. Because I'm not leaning towards mange, but I could be mistaken. Something new I'm learning today. And remember everyone, there is a town hall with Graham Wellington himself, the creator of uh, Wild Earth. Sorry, I was just looking at a tree. And he will be answering all of your questions. Uh, comments, anything that you might want him to know about the show, things that you would like to congratulate about or certain things where you would like to give feedback, well, the town hall will be your chance and then he will also be, of course, sharing news about new exciting developments and things that are happening, beh happening behind the scenes. Yeah, I don't know why I can't talk today. That, you see, I think sometimes and actually little sightings like this one where it's something that's puzzling you, something that's different. I love them. I think these are my favorite moments in the bush. Things where it just catch you by surprise. And it's not something big. It's not, you know, lions on top of a buffalo or something like that. But it is, it is incredible. Gregory, uh, mongoose and squirrels are not in the same family. Squirrels don't have anal glands like the mongoose do. 
Mongoose are more closely related to meerkats in the Herpestidae family and then more closely related, let's put it that way, to um, honey badgers, zorillas or striped pole cats and what's the other animal that I'm, oh, genets and civets of course. So no, technically speaking, no, although they kind of look alike and they all share arboreal, or well not all, they share arboreal habits with some creatures like the genets but I don't know how far we can take it on the family tree before we find a common ancestor. <laughs> Maybe a couple thousand years. But I will have to give you a more detailed answer after do a little bit more of taxonomy research on the squirrel. Oh, and talking about a bit of research, I was looking at, and I always seem to get this wrong, in the morning we were talking about the acacias and how some of them, or they, all of them have been now divided between Senegalias and and uh, what's the other one and the Vacalias. So Senegalias are the knob thorns, and the Senegalias are the ones with the hook thorns and the long sort of bottle-like flowers. Whereas the Vacalias are the one with the straight thorns and the pom-pom flowers. Don't know why I just cannot get those two things right in my head. Always confuse them. It's almost like my brain is refusing to call them something other than acacia. Lots of Ellie tracks going that way. It's much more pleasant down here when the wind is not blowing. Also great tree over there for a leopard to be in, just saying. Oh, hello sunshine. Are you leaving us soon? Maybe another, what, sort of 30 minutes or so before the sun is gone? these tracks. They look like guard for tracks. Let me just have a look before I start saying things that are not true. Sorry everyone, let me just have a good look here. I do think so. Mm, no. been a bunch of trucks just mixed up together that's what it is ho 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 let me just double check it is actually quite sad how rusty you get in terms of tracking when you don't do it for a while and then you see things and you're like mm, not 100% sure if this is what I thought it was but potentially not I mean, it would be pretty epic to see an art park. I haven't seen a live art park in the northern Sabi Sand. I've only seen one, and it was put up a tree by Hokumuri way back in the day. And I know Tingana, the male leopard, and Hokumuri was also a male leopard, went through a stage where he would just hunt them out of their burrows, which, not ideal, it's an animal. It's quite big, so they're actually very big animals. I mean, the body is about this big, so, I don't know. I don't know how to, like a, like a smaller of the bigger dog species um, but they're still quite big anyway I'm gonna stop rambling off and then let's send you guys across to Trishala who's still bumbling in a Makala we have found our baboons and followed them up to this area And now I'm just showing you. Ooh. Just uh, get FC to to stop talking. Thank you, FC. MC. Uh, so yeah, we followed our baboons up here, and then of course they scattered. They stopped alarming, and they were looking down into the valley, uh, and we can't drive in it, so we're just kind of hanging about. Now we've come up onto this ridge where there's heaps and heaps of these aloes and it's just so stunning the landscape has really changed to just aloes being abundant so these are cape aloes or aloferox i remember the word aloferox from 10 years ago even more when i was at university 
such a beautiful plant. And Amakala is named for the aloes. Amakala means aloe in uh, Koza. And the inflorescences are just adored by so many sunbirds. So I'm hoping as well that an amethyst sunbird or maybe even a malachite sunbird is around here somewhere and that they'll be having a bit of a drink of the nectar. But isn't this just such a stunning scene? Isn't it so different to what we're used to seeing in the low felt? And I love, love the broad, broad leaved savannah woodland that we have in the low felt. Love it. It feels like home. But when I drove in here and I saw this change, the color of the soil, this red clay color, and then these aloes all around, it just made me feel like, wow, I am in the Eastern Cape. This is the Eastern Cape. Stunning. So these are also known as bitter aloes because uh, a purgative medication is made out of it. And also it produces the aloe gel that is used in cosmetics and things like that. So super useful plant, not only for us as humans, but also to the animals around them. Sunbirds absolutely love them. I'm just taken away, taken away by this beauty. Hi, Gavin. You'd like to know if the sap inside of an aloe tree is edible? I'm not sure that the aloe tree produces sap. So, aloes are woody. Um, we can't really see the base of one, except for the one that's very close to me, which is going to be awkward. But they are woody, but I'm not sure that they produce sap. Yep, so you can see the bottom there, you can see that it's quite woody. So sap is, is, it's like a separate substance to other things that plants produce. So it's not latexy, it's not resin, it's it's completely separate, so I'm not sure that an aloe produces sap, and I would imagine that there'd have to be significant xylem and phloem networks in an aloe to, in order to produce sap. Uh, and I don't know enough about an aloe to be able to tell you conclusively, but maybe you mean the nectar? Or maybe you mean the actual gel in the flesh of the leaves? So the nectar is definitely edible. It's just that you would have to have a very long mouth, uh, a proboscis perhaps, to help you get to it. But it certainly would be edible. All it is is really water and sugar and maybe a couple other nutrients um, thrown in. We can move back to the other. Oh, you have already. I'm busy like ducking down here. <laughs> Um, the aloe vera gel and the skin, uh, or rather the aloe gel and the skin apparently can be eaten. I myself have not given it a go, but I certainly have applied the gel to one or two or ten bites that I've had in my life. Many, many a uh, bee sting I have suffered. Not suffered really, I've gotten used to them now. Listen up, explorers. We have a brand new prize. This time, you can recline riverside at the breathtaking Settlers Drift Lodge at Kariha Game Reserve. Take a breather from your busy life. Why not treat yourself at the spa or wander into nature on a guided bushwalk, twice daily safari drives, or even a boat river cruise? Open to all levels of explorers. Sign up before the 28th of October, and it could be you jetting off to this luxurious lodge.
Telling you one thing, Odie and I are on top form with our sunsets of late. Just look at that. Look at that. We didn't have much time. I think we were right at the right moment. And this is a quiet moment. Just enjoy this. How lovely is that Cape Turtle Dove in the background? It's almost the imminent end of the day. Paul. Paul says nothing like a Pridelands sunset. No, indeed, Paul, it's. I've said this a hundred times perhaps, but the sunsets here are next level. And I think it's got to do with the structure of the land here. We have typical granite undulating country, but in addition to that, we've got these dolerite copies or hills that gives further elevation so we can literally look at the sunsets from all sorts of perspectives and that's what I truly appreciate of Pridelands and 
and you can literally see how the sun is moving. Look at that. That's actually us moving, not the sun. We're turning. Giving the impression that the sun is moving, but it is actually mostly us. Well, everything is in motion, even the sun. Some very rich colors coming through there. Right, we're going to lose this beautiful art piece very soon. So let's go over to Tessa, who's still with his spiders. <laughs> I'm taking a breather. I'm trying to recover from a near-death experience. I'm literally just saying my heart rate drops a little bit. <laughs> so the wind is pumping and I tried to kind of sit behind this here ginormous community web spider's nest. But I was on that side and Panda was on that side and the wind is blowing this way. And what happened? I was sitting and it blew into my face. This one here, this middle one, that's the one that blew into my face. <sighs> Not okay, so we've changed. We've changed position a little bit, make it a little bit better. <laughs> I do not want 300 spiders on my face. But it is really cool to see, the only problem being, we're trying to show you individual little spiders, but it's so windy that it's not working because the whole thing is blowing. But you can see how big it is. <laughs> it's a very big spider web very big so this anchor actually sorry I'm blowing around please excuse the clothes blowing everywhere this anchor goes all the way to there so that's a decent one meter two meter three meter anchor because it goes all the way I don't want to touch it too much it goes all the way to the top there so that's a three meter anchor three meters Okay, I can see one or two spiders here. Panda, can you see this one? It's blowing too much. <laughs> yeah, so these are the community web spiders. There's a few, many, manys in this nest. Probably, I mean, that's the smallest of them. Luckily, that's the one that blew into my face, the middle one. That one is probably... Anywhere from 50 spiders plus, I'd imagine, but this big one at the top is easily over 100 spiders. And then the little one at the bottom, about the same size, maybe a little bigger, this way. Maybe like 70 plus. So many spiders. Oh, here's one here. I see it. I wonder if it'll stand still. Let me see if I can hold it. No, not really working, eh, Panda? <laughs> Tiny little spiders. So it's about the size of the just the tip of this feather. It's walking along there, but it's blowing too much. Fiona, so this silk can definitely be caught by other animals. You can see this big gap over here. Okay, so that used to be part of the web because here's the rest of the catchment down here. This used to come up. Ah, now it's blowing the other way. You stay still. I'm moving back. <laughs> no. <laughs> so there used to be a catchment web here that an animal definitely walked through. Here at the bottom as well, maybe something like a scrub hair. Through the bush here? No, that's just insects. And this will be only useful to things like birds. Birds collect silk and put it in their nests. But other than that, no other animals would really use it other than spiders. Now, I saw them catching a tick just now. There are a few little dead flies. I can see a dead grasshopper in the middle. Lots of things. I'm going to move out the way now, though, because it's getting very windy. <laughs> I do not want that on my face again. Nope. That came very close. That was a close call. Wow. 
but have a look at how intricate that catchment web is. There's a lot of little silk, silk strands in that whole thing. Derek, spider webs will survive the rain pretty well. They're actually quite waterproof, so you'll see droplets of rain forming or kind of catching on the web and then dripping off. So the silk itself will survive the rain unless it is a massive storm. And with catchment webs like this, you can see in the wind how much the spider web is moving around. It's not going to be ideal. But, you know, it'll have a few breakages, but the main anchor line is super strong. So if I knew that this nest was abandoned and I could show you how strong the silk is, then it would be really cool, but we can't do that. But if I do find an abandoned stretch of it anyway, I will show you how strong it is. But even the bottom catchment piece that's broken off from an animal coming through, even that would still be useful to the spiders, so I'm not going to destroy that. But yes, storms heavy heavy storms with heavy winds hail that would definitely destroy spider webs but the silk itself still survives it just might break in one or two spots but silk is one of the if not the strongest i think it's the strongest natural substance so per little part of silk it is the strongest substance in the world if you were to put this into a massive big pipe just solid silk, nothing would be able to break it. You could fly a Boeing into it and it would bounce back. Oh, goodness, okay, I'm recovering. My heart rate is going down. That was a very scary experience, having spiderwebs in my face. Maybe you've got a funny spiderweb experience you want to share with me or any other questions, any topics you'd like me to cover with the community web spiders or anything else, please do let me know. I'd love to hear from you on the back of my vehicle. It would be awesome. Wow, look how much that is blowing. Okay, I think I've recovered. <laughs> I'm breathing more normally again. <laughs> uh, see, I don't mind spiders. I actually really like them. I find them fascinating. But I must volunteer. This is the thing, right? I must volunteer to have a spider on me. I'm not a fan of having random spiders all over me especially not the silk of the webs because I know it's an amazing thing but it's not amazing when it's stuck on your face and you can't get it off and it's a weird feeling it's a weird feeling so I'm going to carry on and keep looking for a leopard recover and I'll send you over to Ali in the meantime to see what she's up to <laughs> <laughs> Poor Tess, it's never nice facing a creature that you really don't want to look at or that you don't want to face. May it be a spider or, you know, a cat, an elephant or whatever. From big to small, dealing with phobias is not great. And I used to laugh, I remember when I was guiding, because I knew it was summer because the spiders would always find me in my sleep and then I would wake up with random spider bites in all the rooms and then that's when I knew that I had to like start finding like anti-bug spray and things like that. Because there are some potentially dangerous spiders in South Africa. Most of the ones that you'll get really won't do much to you other than give you like a bite that is a bit itchy, like a, mos a bigger mosquito bite. Ticks are by far the worst things that we're going to encounter this summer. I'm sure there's going to be loads of them. Oh, Coloniella, you're looking good there. Just stay there and don't run. Be nice. Because you're very pretty looking right where you are. Where's the rest of your group? We seem to be looking for someone. We had a group of Nyala this morning, so I think maybe she's part of that group, but you see how alert she is. Also an indication that she's not happy with the wind. That constant like moving of the head. You see the ears are going everywhere. Those big satellite dishes just picking up the noises from everywhere. And down here where we are is not as windy as where it is. Even where she is, I think it's a tad windier where she is because it's a bit more open. But there's something there that she thought she had to be aware of. I just want to look in the opposite direction. Ah, oh, here's the other Impala. That's what you're looking at. N not Impala, Niala. I actually haven't really moved from where they were this morning. Silly us. It just goes to show that half of the time we actually don't even know who's looking at us. Maybe we even drove past Molawati earlier today because they're all super chill. So she's there and she is just looking at the other guys down here. I don't know how great the visual is going to be from there. Probably just as bad as 
how I'm seeing them. Maybe let me, if you just stay there, let me go a little bit forward. It's been the Nyala day today. Maybe that's a bit better. Seems like a young male and another female. Not the ones that we saw this morning. Uh, well, with the little one, I mean. We did see those guys this morning when we were um, driving, hoping for the wild dogs. They're all, they're not happy. Something's caught their attention. Of the adults, at least. It seems like the youngster doesn't quite get what's going on. But yeah, not, not the ones with the tiny little baby. We're pretty much on the opposite end of Juma. So, quite a distance from there. The straps are quite pretty. Who knows, maybe they know if the wild dogs are around. Generally with antelope, a good indication that something might not be right or they're a tad alert. And there might be something, there might be nothing. They, they might just be nervous because of the wind. Is the fact that the adults are not really eating. They haven't relaxed. They're not, they're not um, ruminating. They're not lying down. They're just scanning. I'm just trying to figure out what it is that's happening. The youngster seems a little bit, <laughs> a little bit happier with life. A bit of a glutton. Eating all the fret, fret, <laughs> the fresh leaves that are coming out of that little bush there. I don't know what bush it is. Jade, uh, there's always, they don't, I mean, they can have direct conflict with one another, different antelope species, but what they do is they tend to compete indirectly generally for food sources. So in the specific case of Nyala, they have been really bad for the bushbuck population because the bushbuck, also uh, antelope where the males go darker and they have beautiful spiral twisting horns, they're actually um, smaller than Nyala in general and they, their shoulder height is a, lot, is a tad less. So the issue has been that uh, Nyala have been mostly reintroduced to these areas. They shouldn't actually be here because they don't generally occur here, but because they're so pretty, as you can see, um, we reintroduce them pretty much everywhere and they used to be quite expensive to purchase uh, as a game reserve as well I think Pinda actually made a lot of money selling Nyala to the rest of South Africa and when they um, when the Nyala move into an area they can feed at the same height and higher than what a bushbuck can eat so they'll feed on both sides and the bushbuck obviously cannot reach at the same Nyala height so they're gonna have to start feeding lower but then you know, it doesn't always work for them. So they have intraspecific competition, if we can put it that way, in between different antelope species. Or this particular two. She's super alert. Something that she doesn't like. Let's just hang around here. If she barks, then we know there's something serious that she doesn't like. I mean, it could be a leopard around here. Maybe the dogs? Well, I suspect the dogs are gone somewhere else. Maybe scan with a binus. Sandra, I agree. Baby Nyala really are the cutest with their fluffy tails and their fluffy coats. Like a real life Bambi. <laughs> I suppose so, in a way. Although that is a movie I will I don't even understand why somebody thought that that was a child's movie. Definitely not. I think I last saw it when I was about six and then I was like never again. I was scarred. <laughs> I'm really hoping that y'all are gonna bark. <laughs> Gwen and FC also agrees. Hehe. <laughs> no guys. Is it just the wind? Have I been hoping for nothing? Hmm. It's gonna be a good night for leopards and lions. And maybe wildcats and servals and caracals, if they're even around here anymore. I don't know. 
I think, you know, the stress has passed. She doesn't, she doesn't look as stressed and the youngster has also stopped feeding. Uh, I don't think, I don't think there's much here to be concerned about. Let's just give it a couple more seconds, see if anything happens, but if not, then we're just gonna leave them and carry on with our bumble. See what other nocturnal creatures we can find. Yo, wind is picking up quite a bit, yeah. Quite a windy afternoon, yeah. And uh, impalas are moving into the plane. You can see they're quite active. It's almost like a rut like behavior with the males. They're all chasing females around, fighting each other. And that's a sign that their hormone levels are rising. And that's a natural sort of built in mechanism. They're going to almost like a false rut towards the time when the lambing season starts. And it's just to have that natural aggression and that could potentially assist with the deterrent of some predators, small predators that is. That's not going to deter a leopard. But things like jackal and so forth, they can deal with them. So it's possibly a result of the females. Obviously there's a whole bunch of hormones involved with birth and that very likely prompts something of a similar response in the males. So we often see it as we get closer and closer to November, which is usually the time that they give birth, that the males become increasingly more aggressive and acting like it's the rut. With the only exception, there will be no mating as such. And they obviously come out into the open. This is the safest place to be when you're an impala. I believe do female impala participate in anything like rutting? Uh, no, not, not in the true sense. They are the reason that there's a rut. As the rut is especially made for the males, it's a time when they compete and fight for mating rights for the sort of possession of these groups of females. So they don't participate as such, but they are the reason that the rut exists. So therefore, the males fight in order to be able to mate with them. And it's just one of those processes in nature that ensures that only the top males get to breed. We cannot, in any species out here, have every male breed, because some will not be great or, or favorable genetic material. So nature has got this design to make sure that only only the top males get to propagate their genes. The strongest gets to breed. All right, I think this is very much our last little bit of light. So we're going to be going over to Lauren in Madikwe. Good evening, everyone. Any warm welcome from Madikwe Game Reserve. We have a spectacular sighting in front of us two lionesses at Shikudu Dam, the dam that I always see is so quiet. We have had a very frustrating afternoon. We were with a beautiful female che cheetah on an impala kill, but luck was not on our side. However, we are with you all. Good evening. The sun is just set. We just watched it, but here we are. My name is Lauren and I do have Darby on camera and the two lionesses. Let's look at them and not my face. 
we've been to Shakuruda many times. But this is definitely the first predator and or predators, should I say. Here in Madikwe, they call lions Tau. Not Ngala or Ngonyama. They are Tau. I'm sure many of you know that. It's very simple and it's actually a beautiful word. Tau. T-A-U. Where are you guys going? We had a gorgeous male lion the other day and these are our first two lionesses that we put on camera from Matikwe. Oh, the good old antenna. Someone looks very full and not prepared to move. Oh, Ian, the good old question. I don't know if we can really answer that. There is obviously the sort of age old thought that. Lionesses do all the hunting, males come along and just take. Lionesses do do a lot of hunting because they, they have to, to survive. And the males, as we know from the sands, will steal. They do steal from the lionesses. They like to live the easy life. However, male lions absolutely hunt. They are absolutely successful. Think about a coalition, especially three lions, three big male lions. And they run and hunt and take down a kill of course they're going to be successful extremely powerful animals extremely muscular and I think they are just as successful I think that thought that the males just steal from the females is not entirely correct they will of course they will all predators steal from one another hyenas steal lions steal Leopard steal. We watched a wild dog steal the kudu kill the other day. So yes, male lions are notorious for letting the females hunt because there are generally more of them in a pride and they are a lot more sort of in tune with one another, I believe. But are they more successful? Not necessarily, no, when it comes to... Oh, look at this. <laughs> When it comes to male lions, I think when it actually boils down to the success of the hunt, I think they are just as successful. Ian. <laughs> this is what I love about lionesses. It's a very strong bond. I'm not really sure what you mean by that. 
Lionesses are part of a pride. They're a, they're a social animal, and it goes down to what I've been saying a lot recently about what makes that species that species. And very much being a lioness, not really talking about a male lion, it is all about those bonds, that pride unit that you have, that unit of females that look after one another, cooperate in hunting and raise young. So I'm not really sure what you mean by two females staying together for a long time. The females will always stay together for a long time. The pride is a pride. There may be breakaway prides, yes, there may be a sort of uh, dynamic shift, but generally speaking, a, a pride will stay as a pride and the lionesses will stay in that. Whether there are two, whether there are ten, that, that's a pride. So I hope that answered your question. They may go off on their own. They obviously will spend time separately whilst mating and whilst dating. But generally speaking, they will always come back to their unit. The lioness is not going to really survive out there on her own as much as she would as when she's with her pride. Just like the pack is everything to the dog, the pride is everything to a lioness. just amazing how tender they can be with one another. I've had some incredible sightings with lions where um, they definitely are not tender with one another. They will fight over food, they will wallop one another, they will squabble, but when it comes down to it, they need one another. That not smell very nice. Ooh. They both have full bellies. Oh, look at that dam. Shakuru dam. Sorry, I didn't catch that question, MC, one more time. Shikuru actually means white rhino, by the way. That's what the, the word means. So this dam is the white rhino dam in English. Hannah, again, I'm not sure how I could possibly answer that. Do the senses get heightened? Um, what senses are you talking about? And I don't think I would say that. No, I don't think it's possible to answer. I don't think any research has possibly gone into the fact that has does the sight become heightened? Does your hearing become heightened? Does your sense of smell become heightened? I don't believe there is any research into that, but of course there will be lots of physiological and biological changes going on. There will be hormonal changes, pheromone changes, behavioral changes, going through the lactation process. And remember, lactation is not just a simple thing, it's a process and there are different stages of lactation. And with the different stages of lactation comes a different sort of balance of hormones, if you like. It's not it's not just lactation, as, as, as humans know. It is, of course, a process. So I don't think I can answer that, Hannah. I'm sorry. I don't believe it's, it's possible to see if senses get heightened due to giving birth. The birthing process is a, a huge process. Lots of things will change internally, but I don't think we can possibly see whether the senses change. I think we might get a view of them if we just go further up, Darby. Yeah. There we go. 
cycle. Just like in humans, there's a huge sort of cycle of hormonal changes. The lines will go through the exact same hormonal changes. But I hope to some extent that did answer your question. It's a tricky one. Anyway, these lions are moving off and we are losing light. So we're going to stay a little bit longer at Shikudu Dam and we're going to send you guys over to Ali. Well, thankfully we still have an owl. <laughs> of course, they'd love flying away just as soon as, you know, we, we try to put them on camera. But so far we've seen the both of them, the female and what we assume is the male. And we, I'm actually not 100% sure as to where their new um, sort of egg is. I know Tess mentioned that they it's in the same spot as the previous one, but I, we checked where the previous one was. So I think maybe they've just moved it a bit or I just have been long gone and I wouldn't be able to know. But anyway, it's always around here. It's not uncommon for owls to nest in sort of crevices on sandbanks that are big enough to hold them in there. I've seen barn owls also do that. But in this case, these are the famous wigs. Two spotted eagle owls that keep raising their chicks and they're quite fluffy and beautiful. Oh, hi, bye. We'll just stand there for a little bit. Just pose beautifully. And if you're wondering why your screen is black and white, well, we're seeing it in infrared, which allows us to actually th see the things that we can't see all too well with our own eyes. Now, I suspect during, doing uh, there, because of the size difference, if I can get my words out properly, but this is the female and the one that we saw earlier on was the male. It was a tad smaller than this one. I don't know why I thought female owls were smaller than males, but I was mistaken and now I'm corrected. And if you see those tufts on the e uh, on the top of the head, those are actually not sort of ears. They don't they don't the ears don't sit there. But um what they do use them for those tufts have a camouflage purpose. So the idea for them is just to actually break the shape of the head and allow them to blend better with the background. And if we didn't know that they were here, we very likely would have missed them. I think we just got lucky because as we drove in, they were having a bit of a spat um, on the branch that she was sitting earlier on. And then we just saw the two of them flying. So I think maybe they're going to start looking for maybe squirrels that look like gerbils for dinner tonight. <laughs> Yeah, um, generally all animals are protective over their offspring, except if you're a cuckoo, and cuckoos don't really care, because um, they don't really offer too much parental, well, yeah, I've got to be brood parasites, not only the cuckoos, but yes. Um, eagle owls will try to defend their nest from potential predators, try to mob them and take them to go away, and then also why they nest in, in odd places like this one that would offer an added sort of advantage or an added protection from anything that might want to come and eat them so lizards i mean even leopards if they found the eggs or the chicks would eat them smaller cats servals caracals wild cats um what else could eat them other rafters i wouldn't be too happy to have them around they're actually pretty chill so we're kind of hoping that if we sit and we hang tied here for long enough that it's actually going to fly down and then show us exactly where the new nest is so we can come and check tomorrow again. Because I think it would be it would be quite cool just to see it there, you know, making sure its little eggs are nice and warm. If there is an egg, I would imagine there is. Because why else would they be hanging out here? I like owls, they're pretty cool. And it's funny because I didn't see spotted eagle owls for a long time. We used to see them a lot more in the southern part of the Sabi Sand where I used to work. And up here in the north, other than the wigs and the occasional one that probably related to the wigs that we used to see in the Molowanini close to Chitwa Dam. I can't say that we've seen, or I, that I've seen way too many owls up here. It's mostly uh, Barose eagle owls, the ones that we've seen in the, the the smaller species like a bard or a pearl spotted owlet. Although I think, uh, no, it wasn't with you, Craig. Um, I had a really cool sighting a while back, maybe a year back, maybe even a little bit longer, of a barred barn owl. Sorry, that just stayed 
and looked at us for the longest time. I think he was maybe trying to hunt something. And I remember that night also there was a hyena that gave us such a fright because it kind of brushed past my legs and we didn't even hear it coming or anything and it gave me a heart attack. And I like animals but I don't like them touching me. <laughs> Not especially the wild ones. They must keep their distance and so will I. Look at that wind. You can just see all the feathers being ruffled and then just fluffed up. It's picked up again a little bit. Might make it a bit harder for owls. Well, it'll be very useful for leopards and lions and other smaller predators. It might not be the best for owls because they're going to have to navigate through the through the wind just to, <laughs> just to be able to actually land on their prey. Hi, my name is Debbie Dean Hartog and I come from Pretoria in South Africa and I am absolutely thrilled to have won the Wild Earth Prize to the Woodbury Tented Camp in Amakala Game Reserve. Wild Earth has changed my life as I love watching the daily game drives. Thank you, Wild Earth. Sign up today and you could be getting out there to experience it for yourself. Wild Earth Explorers, it's in your name. The sun has set here at Amakala and I felt like this was a fitting good night to the animals. We've got zebra, inland and giraffe all walking up to the top of this hill with a little bit of light behind them as, as the sun slips away. So we've just got silhouettes at the moment but I think it's absolutely stunning. I've had such a wonderful time today. Um, I know we didn't have, we didn't manage to get the cheetah. In fact, you know, they may not have even been there, but the baboon's alarm calling, um, going up and seeing those aloes and that beautiful landscape just really made me feel fully immersed in what is Amakala. And it just, it took my breath away. And I'm so, so glad to have come this side and gone up that ridge. And now to close off our evening, we have a selection of antelope, none of which probably the cheetah would manage to take down. I don't see anything smaller than a zebra there, so very difficult for the cheetah. 
So these guys will probably be safe for the night. Oh! One zebra just kicked another. But otherwise, very, very peaceful. So I'm going to be quiet for just a few seconds. And we take it all in because I think it is really stunning. So special. Tammy, you say beautiful silhouettes. Absolutely. And you thank us as well. Our absolute pleasure. Something about it just said, oh, I want to say good night to the animals and I want to say good night with all of you too. And on behalf of all of you. And I'm pretty sure that I, I'm 100% sure actually that I saw an amethyst sun, but I'm just going to have to come back here again until I can put one on camera for you. So peaceful. And then the crow starts squawking behind me, of course. There's nothing quite like a silhouetted giraffe. <sighs> this is just taking my breath away. Some crows flew over. If it weren't for the sound of some passing vehicles, I think it would be absolutely perfect. The evening hum of the bush is starting to happen now. In the summer, it becomes so, so noisy in the bush. So noisy, and you don't realize it until it stops. But just this constant hum of insects and frogs. It almost sounds like white noise, and I can hear it creeping up, and I'm sure in no time it's going to be full-blown as we head fully into summer. Anyway, this was beautiful. Good night from us, guys, and good night from Amakala for this afternoon. Let me send you back over to Ali in Juma. Well, thankfully, she still decided to go there, and we actually thought she was just going to fly off as she started sort of facing downwards, but actually she just regurgitated a pellet. <laughs> So they don't have teeth, or most birds don't have teeth. And owls cannot digest everything that they eat. So things like bone and hair, they generally just come out in, in a sort of a pellet that they regurgitate. So this one's just dropped down onto the ground. <laughs> we were kind of hoping that she's going to maybe, again, fly back to where she's supposed to go. But at least we know sort of now what trees they like to hang out in. And it's easier for us to come during the day tomorrow and then just check it out. To see where maybe they'll be lying out and about because if they have laid their eggs already they'll be here hopefully tomorrow it's generally the female starts incubating right after they lay the eggs so it could be that they're starting their their patrol tonight or or actually it could be that they haven't laid their eggs yet never mind i take back what i said she's not incubating theirs there probably aren't any eggs maybe they're just fishing for the most suitable spot I have a feeling that there's something behind us. Uh, maybe not. There were some elephants in the distance and we bumped another herd of elephants with also some youngsters, another breeding herd, and it seemed like one of them was unhappy, just breaking some branches and then of course trumpeting and then just making a scene as elephants do. I actually think the elephants might not be too far from us. I think I can hear them in the river, but it could all just also be the rustling of the trees. Let's 
Paloma in South Africa, the spotted eagle owls tend to lie their eggs at the end of the sort of mid to end of the dry season. So they can start, you'll find them starting to nest from July until about October or so. So these guys are right on time, hopefully sometime soon. They'll reveal to us where the little egg is. Because I know Tess mentioned that they Tessa mentioned that they they were in the same spot, but I don't know if anyone's actually seen the eggs for the season. Oop. I thought it was going to fly into my face. <laughs> Hello. So I know this is your spot. You like it down here somewhere. But have you got any little eggs down here? I might as well wait and see where she goes because she's obviously become a tad more comfortable with her presence here. Not that she wouldn't be. I mean, this this owl has been observed enough by a bunch of different wilders guides throughout the years. And well, guess when Juma still had guests. So if it's got anything down here, oh look at you standing so proud and tall. <laughs> it's quite funny how they swap their heads around, isn't it? They move them in very strange ways and it's one of the reasons or their ability to rotate their heads like that why they're not too loved in the rural communities around here oh. uh -huh. where'd it go um holly uh i would imagine the main interaction between one of the cuckoos that we get in the area and a spotted eagle owl is that the owls might try to eat the cuckoo but um i don't know of any cuckoo or any actually bird parasite that parasitizes owl nests. Let me just go forward because maybe the nest is a tad hidden. We can't see it from here. So she's gone down in there. Yeah. Because I can't see. Where are the lights in this car now? Okay. Let's see if maybe... We're not putting any light on it, we're just using the infrared, so everything that you're seeing there, I actually cannot even see it with my bare eyes. I'm just looking at nothing, to be honest. <laughs> there we go. Ah, oh, you are in the same spot. Silly us that we didn't see you the other day. I'm sure we were just looking at the wrong spot. So, she's definitely incubating eggs. She looks quite happy in there. I'm not sure how many eggs she's got, but now we can come and count tomorrow. Oh, yeah. Look at you, little chicken. Looking after your babies, future babies. Hmm. I'm gonna stick around now that we know where she is. She, if maybe we get a glimpse of the eggs. But let's send you guys across over to Tessa, who's still enjoying a bumble. Seems like Wendy's having some gremlin issues. So we're just gonna hang out with Mrs. Wig over here. I almost wish I could go and cuddle her. She looks quite fluffy, doesn't she? And especially on days like today, she might have to keep those eggs pretty warm. The temperature has dropped. I mean, <laughs> on Sunday it's predicted to be about 41 degrees Celsius, which is a whole... how many? How, how hot do you think it was today? Like 36? I think it's probably a, a good six degrees more, so it'll be hotter, so maybe they've actually been very clever and put their nest in there, because otherwise they would have fried eggs for chicks, actually, with how hot it's been in the last couple of days. So I think maybe on Sunday we have a better chance of actually catching them not on the nest itself, because it'll be so hot. So, so hot. See, even though she's well guarded from the top, she's just like sort of hidden with this bush. You see the hair is still sort of swapping around. 
trying to determine where certain sounds are coming from, if there's anything that you should be worried about. Just keeping alert. I mean, you wouldn't, you wouldn't be able to see it. It looks quite funny. What do you say, Green? Should we go look for a leopard? Oh. Maybe we'll bump one somewhere. It's a good time for leopards to be hunting. I think we've had a great view of Mrs. Wig. At least we know now where she actually hangs out. Okay, cannot go anywhere because of signal issues. So, Mrs. Wig, sorry, you're still enjoying your 38 minutes of fame over here. We're gonna move out of here, hopefully found a safe, safer signal area, but we'll send you guys across to Lisa, who, Lisa who's in the Mashatu water hole. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to Mashatu. We have some elephants, as always. Of course, Botswana is very, very famous for elephants. So, of course, we don't want to put any harsh lights on them. And thus, we are just looking at them through the infrared camera. For those of you that don't know me, I'm Lisa, one of the naturalists. Very, very, very fortunate to be able to be in charge of the dam cameras at Okukuyo, Mushatu, even in Juma. And I really have the absolute pleasure of just observing the animals without them even knowing we are here. And today we have actually had quite a few wonderful sightings at this specific watering hole. On Escape to Nature we had two Kori Bastards several times during the day. Which was for me a first. I've never seen two Kori Bastards together. I've seen them before in my life. <laughs> but never actually two of them together in one sighting. So that was pretty cool. And as always, the giraffes were here, some zebras, wildebeest, impalas. And then, as I say, as always, they have been elephants. John, yes, absolutely. It is always such a pleasure to see these giants. Whether it's on sunrise safari, escape to nature, sunset safari. I'm literally, for those of you that are a bit more familiar with me, I'm a sucker for elephants. Literally any time of day, any safari, any journey we're on. So it's always so, so super special for myself to see them. So I'm very happy you agree with me. Alrighty, well, it is obviously becoming darker and that will make it more difficult to see these beauties. 
However, I would like us to take a look at Okokoyo and see what is happening there. Can you believe the difference between the two? Well, between everything, I mean, if you look at Juma and Sabi, with both Tess and Ali, it was already completely dark in Botswana, and now we are in Okokuyo in Namibia, which is obviously a bit more north, and the sun has not yet set. How cool is that? And we've got a beautiful giraffe that is just getting a drink as well. What an absolute immaculate scene. Today we've also had a beautiful day here with all of the antelope coming down. Elephants, there was a massive herd of elephants with tiny babies that had a good swim today. Yesterday we had a very productive day here as well. A lot of black rhino sightings that were happening as well as elephants and oryx. It truly really is such a magnificent spot, this, just to watch the animals. And that giraffe's also actually watching the sunset. That's pretty cool. And of course, the guinea fowl were there. Ever famous call that. Ooh, giraffe, don't slip, please. We cannot afford broken legs for any of you. Don't want anyone getting hurt. Just look at that sun disappearing. That's incredible. That truly is incredible. It almost looks unreal or unbelievable. For me, I love sunrise and sunsets and really any time in the bush. But if I really had to choose, sunset is absolutely amazing. It does not matter where you are, whether you are in the low felt, Botswana, Namibia, Masai Mara. Africa truly always just secures the best sunsets. And there's a little chickadee in the water in front of the, well, both of them, or the dab chicks or the little grebes. Ooh, I just want to see what this bird is. <gasps> my word, it's a Cory Bustard. It's my first Cory Bustard at Ukukuyo. That is so cool.
Look at that. How cool is that? We went down past Twindems just to see if there was anything happening down there in terms of nocturnal life. Not too many things, but we did smell something that was very dead. It seems like it, the smell was blowing from the east, but I think I'm a little bit over the eastern side of Juma at the moment. That's where we spent pretty much the whole day. So I'm just doing Gary Main, Triple M towards the gate and then see if maybe we can catch Shudulu or Tortoise Span or someone, one of those cats. Maybe just on a night patrol or on a mission or something along those lines. And of course the usual, maybe honey badger, porcupine. Oh, we can only hope for a pangolin as well. I mean, if we're going to dream big, we're going to dream big, right? Or a striped polecat. Apparently that's the thing, according to Craig and Taylor. <laughs> Although, to be fair, they've only ever seen it in the Mara. So, we'll give them that. What else could we see? Maybe the imaginary thick tail bush baby that I thought landed on me when I was sleeping this morning. That I don't even know what happened there, but I think I lost years of life last night. I've been awake since two o'clock in the morning, just so that everybody knows. <laughs> it's been a long day for me. Don't know what's happening with my sleep or why I haven't been able to sleep since then. No, it's, it hasn't been for lack of trying, but I don't know. Strange things are happening with my brain at the moment. I see a vehicle coming this way. The very interesting spotlighting pattern. Almost looks like a helicopter. They're going back and forth, back and forth. <laughs> and it's funny because all truckers have a different way of spotlighting and doing their thing. Um, so some of them have like a bouncy way of doing things and then you know we just go around because you're not really looking for I don't know, I don't think you're looking for anything or a shape specific. You're just looking for eyes. Charlotte, you're wondering if it's a highlight to track in the evening. I mean, tracking in the evening is pretty much impossible. Can't really track. Um, it becomes very complicated, very difficult. Hello, how's it going? Good, thanks. See you. Sorry no idea who that was um yeah so charlotte tracking at night is pretty much impossible it's really hard you don't see the tracks nicely and very easily when things go into the bush it's very hard to actually follow them so craig and i were actually discussing it perhaps in certain areas like namibia or Tsualu, a night drive might be a tad more interesting in the sense that you have a better chance of seeing things clearly especially if you're in the desert or you know in an area with a lot of dunes then why you might be here a lot of the times here the nocturnal creatures are sort of smallish or you know except if we're talking of course about the big animals that we tend to see such as lion and leopard we don't really shine the light on a normal safari on diurnal animals like buffalo and rhino and elephant here we're lucky because we get the infrared so we're actually able to see them without disturbing them. So that makes a big difference. But we are just saying in an area like to, like this, and in general, I would say in most of the side of South Africa, when you see things, they're just gonna be running away from you. Or if they're hunting, you don't really wanna follow them in the dark using spotlights and crashing through the bushes because you might spoil the hunt in either in favor of the hunted or the hunter. And if it's something small, like something with cubs and so on, that you don't really want to be shining the spotlight on them either, because they're small and they're still vulnerable to many things. So, I would say, I don't, I don't know. I don't think tracking at night is a thing. I did work for a lodge that apparently back in the 90s, they were offering full moon walks. And then they would take the guests on a full moon walk on the main road, sort of from the lodge, I don't know, up to, I don't know how far, and then go back. And I... When I heard that, all I could think is, was like, you know, thank goodness I was born in this time of, of, of history. 
because <laughs> I don't think that would have been the safest thing I think <laughs> back in the day people did things a, a lot differently and uh, <laughs> Sorry, Gwen, I didn't copy you there. Uh, people used to do things a little bit differently and perhaps they were a tad more, I don't know, if just we were braver or didn't think the consequences through as much. Well, maybe certain things that we consider to, quite foolish to do nowadays. Guys, if you've got any comments or questions, please send them through. We've got a long night drive ahead of us. So it will be a lot more entertaining for everyone. If you want to send us comments, questions about anything or anything relating to Africa, conservation, wildlife behavior. Mm, you know, I suppose we can do botany as well in the dark. We can try. Uh, not too many stars at the moment, but they're coming. The moon is a little bit too bright. I think it's almost going into, I think full moon, maybe tomorrow. I do see Venus, it's out there, just underneath the moon. Alright, spotted cats, stop being so unfriendly and reveal yourselves. Nope, no cats. But it's as good as road as any. Although I suspect. Maybe the cats won't be on their territorial patrol unless they've already got something to eat. Chances are that they're actually going to be hunting and not trying to reveal themselves or make themselves too obvious. I mean, even the dogs were looking pretty full this morning. So I think they also had a good morning today or maybe a good evening last night. It's quite bright, so maybe they also got up to some early morning or late evening hunting missions. And it, and it is amazing actually how much uh, you can see on a night that there is a full moon, even to the naked eye. I mean, and it's a bad thing because a lot of us, what we do is, and I am fully guilty of this, we tend to just either consider that our phone torches are enough and walk without a proper torch. Or a flashlight which is actually pretty reckless and we shouldn't be doing that so I made a concerted effort this time to actually bring a torch <laughs> so I have no excuse to be responsible anymore well, seems like Lisa is still finding interesting things so let's head over to her and find out what she's looking at Thank you, Ali, and best of luck with the spotted kitties. I really hope you guys find them. Just before we lose all of our light in Etosha, I wanted to show you this cool bird. And uh, I actually wanted to do a challenge and play the call for you and have you guys guess what animal makes this sound. But as I say, we are losing light rapidly. So for those of you that do not know what this bird sounds like, and this bird, by the way, is a Cory Bustard, please just have a listen to this. Now I know for me the first time I heard that call I was coincidentally on a leg stretch on safari and uh, I think I needed to change my underwear to be honest. <laughs> I honestly thought it's a leopard that's broken or something that is not calling correctly but yes, that is what the Koribas did actually sounds like. This very fascinating bird that is constantly walking away from me. Dylan, yes, a frog. It could sound like a frog. As I say, for me, the first time I heard it, I thought it's a leopard that's a bit delayed or something. Um, it's all, almost like an impala as well, you know. It doesn't quite match the look. Because impalas, apart from barking when they call each other, it's like a... <laughs> 
So yes, when you look at this bird, which is having an, having a excellent time at camouflaging amongst these beautiful rocks, you would not think that is the noise that comes from it. Honestly, I really thought it's a predator the first time I heard it. And it was just a cory busted, like this beautiful one. Nina, thank you so much for your comment. We love hearing from you. <laughs> yes, it does sound like a burp. Um, yes, for me, as I say, it's a very intimidating noise coming from a bird. You don't expect that. But of course, they love areas like this as well. They take a lot of advantage of burnt areas because that will often create creepy crawlies and insects and everything to come out even more. So specifically this season we're heading in now, raining season in Africa or in Southern Africa, they are gonna love that because that's gonna create a lot of reptiles to come out, snakes, lizards, and of course all of the creepy crawlies. Alrighty, well, thank you so much for listening to my... I did not make the call. I make other bird calls, but I cannot imitate that. <laughs> thank you so much for joining me and my Kori Bastard here in Ukukuyo. But I believe we are going to have a look at the moon. So we have finally found a spot where we can show you the almost, almost, almost full moon. And in fact, Venus is out as well, the morning and evening star. But the moon is really the ultimate star tonight because it is just absolutely stunning. And in fact, it's a hunter's moon at the moment, which is the first full moon of October. And the full moon is going to be on Sunday. So we are literally just days away from a gorgeous full moon. You can see all of those dark spots on the surface. Those are all of the craters that have formed over time. Many, 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 many years. More than we can even fathom, realistically. And it's just one of those, one of those skies that you, you can't forget with a moon like that. But it feels like such a it feels like such a privilege to see this moon in a clear African sky. The Explorers program brings nature lovers together and helps share authentic wildlife experiences with the world. Explorers receive so many great benefits, including a chance to watch completely ad-free, luxury travel prizes, access to behind-the-scenes content. And don't forget the weekly newsletter filled with inside information. Explorer subscriptions are available in monthly, six monthly and yearly. Find out more on our website.
It almost seems like I think there's a little bit of moisture in the air still and this wind is blowing in a little bit of cloud cover every now and then. In fact, just now it was almost an overcast sky again and now it looks mostly clear with the odd patch coming over. But because of that, the moon looks like it has a glow around it almost. And that's quite beautiful. It gives an amazing brightness. I wish I could show you how much I can see just in the moonlight. But we can't pick it up. <laughs> Dora, this is actually a really cool question. My favorite constellation is actually based on the star Sirius, which is the brightest star in the night sky. It literally means glowing or scorching. And it's in Canis Major, which is my favorite constellation because of Sirius. It's not a particularly overwhelming constellation. It doesn't have a million stars that we can see in a very distinct pattern. It's just in our night sky when we see it, we see it with Orion. It's known as one of Orion's hunting dogs, Canis Major. And to us, it actually looks upside down for most of the time that we can see Orion, if not all of it. It's an upside down dog and Sirius forms almost the shoulder of Canis Major. Or Canis Majoris is the other name. And I think that affiliation to Sirius being the brightest sky, I mean, brightest sky, the brightest star in the night sky, it came from my extreme love of, it's going to sound ridiculous probably, but Harry Potter. Because of J.K. Rowling's attention to detail, the way that she based so many different characters on realistic scientific foundation just absolutely blew my mind and I always loved the idea of seeing dogs in the sky because Orion was in fact the first constellation I ever learned the three sisters as we used to call it which is actually Orion's belt and that was the first constellation I learned and then the next thing I learned was well he actually has two dogs two hunting dogs and this is the one that you can really see and that really bright one that it's its shoulder that's serious and I think that was kind of where it started for me. I know it's not an overly overwhelming constellation. It's not it's not absolutely mind blowing when you look at some of the others like the jewel box or or Scorpio, which has such a clear scorpion shape or any of those. And not even to mention the thousands of others. Ben is actually the right person to ask about all of those constellations. Just to me, it holds a personal connection and that's that's why I like it. I can recognize quite a few of the main constellations, things like Taurus and Scorpio and Orion and the Jewel Box and all of those things. Um, but I don't know, I've always just loved Canis Majoris and Sirius. And it's confusing because you can see Venus in the night sky tonight. Venus is the morning and evening star and it looks like the brightest star in the sky. But when you can see Sirius, it puts Venus to shame. It really does. It is so beautiful and so bright. Thank you for the question. I love that one. Does anyone know the distance from the moon to the earth? Let me know if you do know. I'd love to know if you know it. It's a massive number. It is very hard to wrap your mind around how far away that moon is that we are looking at. But luckily, Panda's camera work brings it right to the fore. I love it. But also, any other questions you have? Maybe a cool story that you relate to with the moon? Maybe you want to howl like a werewolf for me? <laughs> I don't know. Let me know. I'm looking forward to hearing some of it. But it's. I just I remember thinking... I mean, this is the fifth largest moon that we have in our solar system. I don't know if you knew that, but <clears throat> it's the fifth largest and it looks quite tiny in our sky. But with full moon, it looks obviously a lot bigger than when it looks like a little toenail or a smile. But thinking about how far away that <laughs> that satellite is from us is amazing. <laughs> it's a very impressive distance. I can't wait to see if anyone knows it. Maybe it's a good time to ask Ali if she knows what the distance is from the moon to the earth. Well, we've been playing a bit of a game with the scrub here. 
generally what happens is that when you're driving on the roads and if you bump into them and your lights are on, they'll carry on forever on the road. And in case of this little one, we actually switched off all the lights. We're just driving in complete darkness and this little scrub here, I don't know, it just ran for a good, like sort of 50 meters even. And then it was just not veering off the road despite our best efforts, but I mean, it eventually did change its course of direction and left the road. And sometimes what they do, and they're not great, it's almost like squirrels, they will run and then you think that they're going one way and all of a sudden they'll turn and then run the other way. So you can easily drive over one of them when they do that just because you're not expecting it, not because you'd want to. <laughs> so this one, I think, couldn't decide where it wanted to go. It took a long time. And we just didn't see it. So far, no luck with pretty much anything. Not other than the scrub here that we saw. Just an, maybe a herd of elephants that we could see just crossed the road and then went into the thicket. Lots of elephants this afternoon. So if tomorrow is nice and hot, might be a good day to go look for elephants at some of the dams. Elephants in water is, that's always something cool. Especially somewhere like a Chitu Dam where there should still be a lot of water. Maybe we should, that should be our mission tomorrow afternoon just head towards the dam and then just see what comes down and what's, what happens there. I've just, I checked the weather app just to see if tomorrow was going to be windy again, oh my voice, or if it was going to be a tad better, but now the temperature has even increased by 2 degrees for Sunday. Also to be fair the weather app didn't tell me far enough in advance that it was going to be this cold or this windy today, so always take them with a pinch of salt. I know they are better, better weather apps and it's quite funny because Taylor's quite obsessed with one called Windy that just shows everything. So she actually was made <laughs> to delete it off her phone by her partner because um, Tracy said that Taylor was a tad too obsessed with checking this weather app all the time. <laughs> and then Taylor sneakily downloaded it when she had to go on a private safari to Tanzania just to see what the temperature was going to be. And the other day she admitted and she was like, no, I had to download it again. I was like, ah, oh, I'm an addict. <laughs> You've fallen down the rabbit hole again. So, <laughs> if you ever want to know what the weather is doing, or if you want to give someone an excuse to check a proper weather app, ask Taylor. She'll be happy to tell you. <laughs> and we should have actually done that. Should have asked Taylor to give me the lowdown of what weather to expect here the next few days. Pardon? Oh. Craig spotted an owl that I missed, so we're just gonna go back and see if maybe we can see it. Um, Lily, birds of prey are generally not, unless you're talking about owls, they're not generally active at night. It's gone. Oh. Was it a big owl or a small owl? Ah, uh, pearl spotted owlet. That would have been nice, but I missed it, I didn't see it. Oh well, maybe we'll find another one. So yeah, other than the owls, big birds of prey, like all the eagles and so on, they're going to be roosting and keeping themselves nice and warm wherever they are tonight. Probably tucked or against the trunk of a tree or something like that. I think the place where I've seen the most owls in my life was actually in the Khalakhari, which is a transfrontier park that sits between Namibia, South Africa and Botswana, so on the western side of Botswana, closer to the Kalahari, and well, or in the Kalahari Desert, and oh, we saw so many different species of owls, white face, spotted eagle owls, tons of um, pearl spotted and barred owlets, it was pretty cool, because everywhere we turned we would see either a wildcat or an owl. So that was a pretty spectacular trip to do. And it's one of those parks that has become increasingly popular for predator sightings, but increasingly di difficult to actually be able to go there as a tourist. Because, oh, I think you've got to book at least a year in advance if you want to go like uh, over the good period or over school holidays. I mean, Christmas is near and New Year's are pretty much impossible. So it's not an easy camp to get into, but the game viewing tends to be pretty good. So. And so I actually saw a post today somewhere on the social media pages. There's a, of course, there's a leopard project there. 
and there were some very cool photos of one of the one of the females somewhere in the park just carrying its two cubs so that was pretty cool just to see that they're still doing well and reproducing and they do have much larger uh, territories in the Kalahari area just because they need to travel a bit more um, for food for food and water because the uh, Kalahari is an interesting park you basically drive up two main roads the Aub and the no well the Aub and the Nosom I think that's the correct order and then you just pretty much drive up and down so there instead of looking for creatures like what we're doing now you just pretty much sit still at a water hole especially in the dry season because if things are there they'll have to come and drink at some stage so your best bet is just to sit at a water hole and see what comes there and then of course the lions and the leopards and the cheetahs know that if they go to a water hole at a certain time their chances of actually or if they just stay there during the day their chances of having an easy meal or an easier meal are much higher so it's a pretty cool park to visit We have managed to find a member of the Juma clan, but it's moving away. And out of range. Oh no. That's disappointing. All right. Well, we are not going to follow past there because that goes straight to Yuri's house. <laughs> so I'm definitely not going to be following down there and ending up at somebody's front gate. Probably not the best idea. But we did have, let's see if we can find them again. We had some water back that had walked straight past that did not even move. Not bothered about the hyena. Let's see if we can find them. I think they're on the right here somewhere. Yes, I see eyes. I see eyes. Alright, maybe we can get those awesome you can see their eyes reflecting even in the headlights of the car it seems like we are kind of starting to relax for the night I wonder if they're gonna sleep here huh. also I did not get an ID on that hyena it was far too quick and in the dark <laughs> But I know it wasn't Swazi or Indabele. <laughs> Max, it is quite a, an interesting concept to wrap your head around when the eyes reflect in infrared, reflecting that kind of surface on the back of the eye. I suppose it does look a bit strange and it, it definitely takes getting used to, but um, it is incredible because it it shows you how good their eyes are in you know in in the bigger scheme of things it shows you how good the eyes are because that reflective surface at the back of the eye that is what is helping these animals to see but it's also what helps the eye make an image in general so it's just absolutely brilliant but it does look a bit strange I'm, I'm not gonna lie you know you have a beautiful leopard or something walking towards you and there's just these glowing eyes although I think it suits a leopard better probably than it suits a waterbuck for example but it is still very windy I'm sure you can hear it I think these animals are gonna be hunkering down and getting ready for a bit of a chilly night and it's one of those nights again where you have to have a compromise between safety and warmth because it's cold it's cold yay we've got some answers for the moon ah dark main lover you did exceptionally well there 239,000 and something miles from the earth the moon to the earth that is almost well it is actually probably exactly right rounding it up though to make it a little bit easier I'll take it to 240,000 miles from the earth that equates to 385,000 kilometers it would take so long to walk that distance imagine if we had to walk from here to the moon oh my goodness 
that is such it's it's a it's a distance it's it's actually hard to fathom how would i measure that that would be a couple times around the earth many times <laughs> if we had to walk that distance i think all of us would change our demeanors we change our body shapes we would change our personalities our mindsets everything would would go whether it would be good or bad for each person i don't know i think each factor would <laughs> would be different but i suppose walking that distance if you hydrated properly you'd probably come out 10 sizes smaller on the other side no matter what size you already are it would be quite interesting or maybe 10 times more muscular that's a good one to look at as well muscular and toned but how cool is that 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 is the distance from here to that moon that we were looking at it looks so close and even when we look at it tonight you know we were looking at it earlier and it's lighting up it's lighting up the ground it's reflecting enough light that we can see the road clearly I can see those water back with a naked eye vaguely but I can see them and they're a good 30 meters away probably maybe a little closer but not by much I mean, that's the power. Unreal. Now, I don't know if we are going to be graced by any other water buck, but I'm guessing this is part of the same herd that I started my afternoon with earlier, which is a nice full circle. There were zebras up here too, but they were so nervous they ran away. And that would have been a big full circle because I started with zebras this morning. And then I started with water buck this afternoon. And definitely part of the same herd. The herd we had earlier had four males and a few females, and there's only three males here. So I don't know where the rest are. Maybe they're still down at Gari Dam. Maybe they're on the other side of quarantine. But it's that trade-off that we were talking about earlier between safety and warmth. Because it's so cold, they might have to sit closer together, and they might have to find something like those bush, bushes you can see behind in the distance. They might have to sleep against one of those, not a few meters away, but against it as a bit of a wind barrier. But they also can't choose an area that's too thick. Because of the wind, the predators will be taking advantage, so they need to have a wide field of view. They need to have good depth perception in the dark to see predators coming from a distance because they won't be able to hear them. They won't be able to hear them until it's too late. So it's that really hard trade-off just to try and figure out, okay, how much heat can I afford to lose to stay safer tonight? And it's a, it's a very hard balance to find. Wild Earth is excited to announce the launch of our massively updated app. There are so many brand new features that we have to share with you. Tune in to our live channel and if you are an explorer, you can now watch completely ad-free on the app. There are also many other channels including behind the scenes. You can find the app on app stores worldwide.
Good evening and welcome back to Ukukuyo. I am utterly excited. It is Lisa, by the way. <laughs> we have lions in Ukukuyo. This is so, so, so cool. It is a first for me. Let me just see if I can take a little bit of a further look away. Hopefully we can see them a bit nicer. Oh, I'm so thrilled right now. Honestly, I've not seen lions in Ukukuyo. Well, really, since I've been a naturalist on any of the dam camps, I have, of course, seen them on this wonderful wild earth experience, but not yet for myself. All right, just bear with me. Just bear with me. We are very fortunate to be able to have the technology that we do to be able to see all of these wonderful animals. I was just saying to Sitle, our director, I was watching the various damn cameras and of course it's very cool being able to do that. And I saw these, at first it was two specks that came up to the water and I was like, what is that? And of course, this is a massive watering hole, as you can see, you know, these lions look like tiny specks in comparison to it. And when I went in a little bit closer, I saw that we have lions, my very first lions. I'm going to try to get us a little bit closer. Just bear with me, please. Of course, it is nighttime and we are very fortunate, though, for the beautiful light we have here at this watering hole, which does help us. Because had it not been for that, I would have not known there were lions here. So it seems like just the three females, but of course it could be more of them. You never know who is lying there just off in the background. Could be a male with them, could be more lions. But they do seem fairly young as well. Alrighty folks, well I just wanted to share that with you. As I say, that was my first time, not just at Ukukoyo, but as a naturalist for Wild Earth to see predators. So I am utterly excited and happy and thrilled. So you are more than welcome to head on back to Tess in Juma. Oh, Lisa, first time having lions at Ukukoyo. Well done. That is awesome. How exciting. Wow, I bet these water buck are glad that the lions aren't here. <laughs> they definitely don't look like they're worried about lions at the moment, but they internally they are worried. So as much as they might be lying there and even ruminating, they are listening, they are watching, they're awake, they're being careful. So I don't know what this weather is going to cause for tomorrow. 
We didn't expect this much wind today, I can tell you that much. It was supposed to be a very hot, dry kind of day, and it actually ended up being a bit of an overcast day, a lot of wind, and it's freezing cold at the moment. It's almost like winter. We were chatting about maybe getting some blankets back on the cars. <laughs> it's been that cold tonight. So I don't know what this will mean for for us for tomorrow morning, but we're going to be out here anyway. We're going to be trying our best. The water buck will probably still be here in the morning, as hopefully all the zebras and the impalas. They're on the other side of quarantine, but looking so, so nervous. They are standing. They were not sitting. We couldn't get within 50 meters of the zebras and the impalas. They were just scattering. This wind is just too much. Oh, Lala, you are most welcome. I'm so happy that you enjoyed the sunset and the moon and, and all of these beautiful things. A bit of a different safari this afternoon, but it was such a pleasure having you with us. Thank you to everybody who joined us for a very different, windy, but successful with some of the stranger things safari, I suppose. And what a win, those lions at Ukukuyu. We will be out and about again tomorrow morning though, so please, if you do want to join us for the Sunrise Safari to continue the adventure, we'll be out at 5.30 a.m. Central African time. We are excited. We are ready. Hopefully the predators come out in this wind and we'll find some tracks. But thanks again to everybody for joining us. Good night. is advised.